This is my family tree. Not completely comprehensive, but it goes back six generations from me. Hugh McCarran to Michael McCarran to Hugh John McCarran with his wife Margaret. They had 11 kids all together, including my great grandpa. And then you go down to my grandfather and aunts and uncles, my father, and then down to me. But if you move back up the chart to my great grandfather's, who had 11 or 10 siblings, one of them was a Joseph C. McCarran, and his son was Joseph McCarran, born in 1917. And today I am with my cousin twice removed, Joseph McCarran. How you doing, Joseph? Fine. Hi. Hi, Joe. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here in St. Louis with my, uh, and I was very happy to meet my uh, long-lost uh, cousin twice removed, Joe. Yeah. How, how you doing, Joe? Pretty good. Mm -hmm. And um, now, uh, so you were born in 1917, right? Correct. And you seem to be very much a, the genealogist of the family. <laughs> Yeah, I have plenty of time in my hands. <laughs> um, now, let's see, you were born in what, February? Of, February 16th. Of 1917, wow. And um, during that time, you have, uh, you've had a lot of history. Uh, you went and, um, let's see, you're married now? Or, you, well, well your, your, your wife passed away. Now. Yeah. But you got married and had five kids. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, now is, um, so let's see, so tell me a little bit about your life from the early days. Well, uh, I was born in Florida and then ended up in a lot of blank spots there because I was young yet, but, uh -huh. but moved to Chicago sometime in that period. And uh, lived on Hamlin Avenue for before I would. Well, I went to school. My first school was out of Hamlin Avenue. I don't know the name of it. It was a public school. And then the next thing I knew, we were in Elmwood Park, living, had a store front and living behind it. Father was had started out as a yellow cab driver. He worked nights. And uh, as an aside, uh, mother used to look for change in his pocket during the day while he was sleeping mm -hmm. to get you know some of the money, because that's what tips were. They, these were depression days, and mm -hmm. and uh, tips now we change. laugh at getting t tips <laughs> and change. Yeah, well, that was before the inflation that we have now. <laughs> well, somewhere along the line, and I didn't really catch on to it, but apparently the folks were breaking up. And it was a no-no, of course, for an Irish youth in Chicago at that period of time to have his folks divorced. Yeah. And uh, very unusual. And it wasn't wasn't easy. First it was a split up. And whether that meant they were going to get together again. And father took me out to Aunt Bella's in Maywood, where I stayed and went to school in Maywood. I had gone to school in Elmwood Park mm -hmm. and went to a lot of schools. Illinois, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Illinois, sure. We're close to Chicago. So you moved from Florida to Illinois when you were a boy? Yeah, well, I found out I went to Michigan before that, but, huh. yeah, oh, wow. but after, sometime after that, Ended up in Chicago, yeah, okay. and uh, which I almost lost track here. But the, Sorry. anyways, I was living with Aunt Bella in Maywood with her husband George Denon. She had two, two, two daughters, uh, Helen and Ruth. Might as well get their names in there. Mm -hmm. she, uh, Aunt Bella was a McCarran. She was. Uh, a sister of my brother, my father. And one day my mother came to take uh, take me for a visit 
it never came back, it never took me back to Maywood. Hmm. And so I ended up back with her in Elmwood Park, along with my brother who had stayed there. In other words, whatever they decided, she was keeping this younger brother and dad was taking the older one. And then we went for a short time, and a fan hit, you know what, and <laughs> we uh, were in, well actually it was an orphanage put there, I know by the courts, but of course I didn't know it, but, and it was, for some reason I think it was St. Anthony's Orphanage, but it, it was a Catholic orphanage because we went to church every morning and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Then the divorce must have been settled, and I don't want to know what it was about. Mm -hmm. And we were put in to St. I mean, Bishop, uh, Bishop Quarter Boarding School, Bo Bo Bishop Quarter Boarding School for Boys. And this was also in Oak Park, 605 West Lake Street, across the street, street then, what was then the Proviso, I mean the Oak Park High School uh, Auditorium. It's no, no longer there, neither is the, the school. And I stayed there for five years. At summertime, my brother and I did. And it was run by Dominican nuns, so it was only a boys' school and all nuns. And the priest came in, I guess, every morning. He, he didn't stay there as far as I could tell. And uh, we had mass every morning, as you might expect. Mm -hmm. and all ate in a communal refectory, just like you would in the army, sort of thing. And we were controlled by the, the main nun, uh, Sister Bernard. Okay. And she was big enough to handle it, any of the boys. Huh. She had a wooden stick, you know, the kind that you use uh, to work oh. in a pot and stuff, but mm -hmm. sturdy enough. And I never, I guess I was a good boy, <laughs> I never got in trouble because I would, it would, that basically was either talking instead of eating or horsing around or not eating your food. Brother Jim didn't like spaghetti and he always got in trouble because he, he just wouldn't eat it. And I, I liked it. I've mm -hmm. always liked spaghetti. <laughs> and so he got, he said whacked a couple of times. I didn't know. <laughs> we, we probably didn't even sit together with, you know, he was, he was a lowly first grader. And oh, that's right. Your brother Jim was a few years younger than you. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was 14 months younger, but he was two grades behind. Okay. It turned out that way. And in fact, I never went to second grade because I kept going around to schools, first school in Chicago, then a school in Elmwood Park, school in Maywood. And so I was just going from first grade to first grade to first grade. <laughs> now, when we went to the boarding school, the nuns figured, well, you should be in third grade for your age. And so I, I went. <laughs> and, Jumped up a grade. And I could always complain, well, I missed out on whatever it was in second grade. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we in retrospect, we, we sort of enjoyed the boarding school. Summertime, so we never got to go to summer camp because mm -hmm. I guess Dad was saving money. Mm -hmm. He was working his way up in the cab company, but he was still, you know, money was a factor. So we'd be shipped to either Grandma or sometimes my mother was in town at the Hamlin Avenue address and we'd stay with her and stayed with Aunt Mary another year, whatever year. L. Smith came to town for the, he was running for president. President against Roosevelt, right? Yes, yeah. whatever year that was. I'm not sure. And I remember being at Aunt Mary's when the, either the Graf Zeppelin or the other one passed over, you know, 
looked like a mountain up there. <laughs> Is that, you know, the... Oh. Yeah. And from there, uh, we went to uh, Berry Avenue, which was a short street down in the city, and at the, the juncture of Halsted and Clark. In Chicago. And Berry Avenue shot off from there. And I did my eighth grade there, and uh, I guess Joey, uh, Jim was sixth grade, whatever. And we enjoyed that because we got to go down. We were close to the Lake Michigan, and in the summer we were free as a bird and <laughs> go down there. Mm. And after that, then <laughs> I went to St. Patrick's High School, and Dad worked across the street. He was now a garage manager with a, a fleet of yellow cabs. And uh, I was taken out of there after the first semester. And what happened is he married this Polish uh, woman, a widow. She was a, had a young son and a daughter younger than we were. And we all moved in together, out in 5944 Wrightwood Avenue, which was close to Austin Avenue and a little south of Belmont Avenue. And then I went to, after St. Patrick's, I went to Foreman, then Wright Junior, before it was the junior college, but, and then from there I went to uh, Shure School, and finally my fourth year. I was in the first class at Steinmetz High School. Hmm. Wow. And as soon as I graduated, I wasn't happy there, to tell the truth. Huh. But that's, I don't want to expand on it. Uh, as soon as I graduated, in fact, at the graduation, Uncle Willie, or for some of you, Grandfather William. That was my, gr my great-grandfather. Yeah. Your, which is your Uncle Willie. Yeah. And, uh, That's the only name we ever knew him by. That was him there. He came to my graduation, gave me a pen and pencil set, and a job at his Ford agency. McCarran Ford dealership in Chicago. Right? Damon and Division area. Wow. And that's where your Uncle Willie, which is my great-grandfather, as well as my grandfather, and his younger brother, my granduncle Bud. Yeah. Even Uncle Walter worked. So you got a job there right after high school. Yeah. And he gave you that pen set as a present, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I heard later from Jim that that happened with him, that Uncle Willie came to his graduation, that Dad missed it because he had broken a leg, which I didn't, I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was gone then. I moved out of the house when I went to work for Uncle Willie. Okay, so you moved out and moved to Chicago, or you're already in Chicago, but you lived... Yeah, uh, I, I moved on to Damon uh, Avenue, close by. I could walk across the street to the... So, yeah, after you... So you started working there when you were 18, and you moved in. Yeah. Where did you say again? Near. Uh, at a rooming house there on Damon Avenue, uh, north of the of Division, just walking distance to work. And what was it like working with my great-grandfather, as well as my grandfather and uncle's son? <laughs> well, he, he was kind of a crabby fellow to work for. <laughs> but I'd, That's what I, understand. I, I had been around him before. We, For some reason, I can't re remember why, but Jim and I would be riding with him a lot, driving around the town or something. And th this was a period when they were having People were striking for more money and that sort of stuff. <laughs> and he would stop, you know, we'd cringe because he'd cuss them out, get to work, you. <laughs> the union like strikers, that. yeah. Of course, he was in the car, you could take off it. <laughs> <laughs> but he probably stayed a fight. <laughs> oh, boy. So he, now you remember my great grandpa even way before you worked for him, obviously. Oh, yeah. When you were little. Yeah. I remember, yeah, we used to go to his house when we were little, and 
ate there. I think stayed there sometimes, mm -hmm. but I can't pinpoint the time. And we we visit with Aunt Kitty, and his I'm wife, yeah, Aunt my Kitty. great grandmother, yeah, yeah. And I can't remember if she was bedridden by then, or it was later for sure. But I know later she was bedridden. Wow. So uh, now. Uh, so what was, uh, when you were a little kid, uh, you say Uncle Willie still had the temper, which is my great-grandpa, and Aunt Kitty was my great-grandmother. Oh, you don't get rid of temper. <laughs> but he, was he nice to you guys sometimes, or just... Uh... Well, yeah, it's just that... Well, I, I remember uh, when I visited his house when somewhere along my growth period, and I always noticed they had a grand piano in. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, does anybody play that? And he sat down and started playing. Oh. I wouldn't say professionally, but he, he could play songs. Huh. So he had that talent, you know. That might have been the same grand piano that I saw in my grandfather's house. I'm not sure. I grew could up, be. my grandpa, his son, your cousin, yeah. Bill, you know, he... Uh, there was a big one growing up in their house, so yeah. I'm not sure if it's the same thing. Could well be, yeah. yeah. Wow, so he played piano. So that was another little thing that I remember. And you said one year somebody dressed up as Santa Claus. It might have been him, it might not. I think it was more likely one of the boys. Okay. And knowing the boys, I think it was more likely Bud. Bud? <laughs> but I, I, because he was more joking around stuff, you know, that sort of thing. Wow. Well. So, uh, so you worked at the uh, McCarran Ford dealership. What were your duties there? What was your job? Well, I was the flunky. I was the office boy. Uh huh. And they probably made a job for me. You know, mm -hmm. probably one of the girls had to do stuff that I uh -huh. took over, like, you know, answering the telephone, that sort of stuff. Mm hmm. And um. Did he, he paid okay for the time or, you know? Nine dollars a week. Was that good or bad back then? I, I can't even well, tell. It's been so long. Well, I, I paid for my room. I don't know what I paid for the room, but it must have been like two dollars or something. Yeah. And I bought all my meals. Mm -hmm. So, and knowing me, I, I, I don't overspend. I, <laughs> so I must have probably had a dollar left over. Did he have a car back then, or? No, but this is <laughs> this is one I haven't told anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the salesman there, not Bud and Bill, but the other salesman, mm -hmm. they said, you know, you're a McCarran. You, they're driving new Fords, I guess, probably, mm -hmm. and you ought to have something to drive. So they took me around and got me a car. Oh wow! <laughs> and put put dealer licenses on it, mm -hmm. and uh, then I, I when I was off, maybe Sunday I suppose would be the day off. Mm -hmm. I'd drive around and maybe well, with some of the friends that I knew that played ball with, and you mm -hmm. know was, nobody nobody I knew at my age had cars to drive. Do you know what model that was, or no? Oh. <laughs> I don't even know what it was. But uh, it wasn't. I remember, it wasn't a Ford. I, I, I know that. But and uh, one time got stopped by the police because they were wondering what these young guys are doing with the a de a dealer's plate on an <laughs> old car. And I told them, I, "My name is McCarran. I work for McCarran Company, and I guess, I guess the, they believe it." But what happened is. is I finally got caught. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong, and I don't know as I was, but I had the car parked out in front of where I lived, which is only a few doors down. They could have seen it any time they drove down Damon Avenue. But the person who owned the apartment, or the place that you know I rented, he saw this car parked out there all the time because I didn't drive it to work half a block, you know, I just left it there and was sitting there most of the week. Mm -hmm. And so they reported it and the police came, checked it, 
probably walked across the street to him, mm. talked to him, and said, you're missing a scar. Mm. And then somebody, then... Uh, oh, mistaken for a stolen vehicle. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I, I lost the car then. Uh, well, they, they gave you permission to drive it, so I don't know why that would be a issue. You know? Yeah, but but uh, <laughs> the sales, other sales people, they just, they just said, you should be able to drive. You're working for them, and everybody else has got a car, but uh, <laughs> they took it away. Uh. Also, Uncle Willie had a, a boat then. I'm saying boat because I'm not up on what's a yacht and what's a nut. <laughs> and yeah. it wasn't real big, but he had it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're going to have a company party there. Mm -hmm. So Jim and I got to go there and I guess even actually did painting and that sort of stuff. We worked hard. You and your brother. Yeah. yeah. But when the party came, we didn't get invited. Oh. So now, I don't know whether the party got a little wild or not. I don't know. But was Uncle Willie th known to throw wild parties, or <laughs> not that I know of? <laughs> but uh, I've heard that people that did sometimes go there and I guess out in the water have a drink or two because this was Prohibition days. Oh. And this was on Lake Michigan? This yeah, Lake boat. Michigan, yeah. So now, was... I can't say that he... I can't remember where he kept it exactly. Hmm. You know, it was in dock, like, it was in the water, but it was at wherever it was kept. But I can't remember whether it's in a ways or, or what. Because uh, my father always thought that, you know, great-grandpa was a millionaire. Your Uncle Willie, my great-grandpa, was a millionaire. But... Yeah, I, I know that's disputed I, by my aunt I'd and by yourself. Yeah. I don't think it was quite that. He was well off, but not a millionaire. Yeah. But he had a he had a boat, a decent boat, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, now you said that one time he got real ornery and he thought a thief was downstairs or something like that. Well, I wasn't there then. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, young Walter, the son of. Of Walter Senior. Yeah, Wal Walter was uh, w your uncle Willie's son, my yeah. my grandpa's brother, and then Walter but Junior. I didn't hear this story because I had left by then uh -huh. when this happened. But uh, I remember the place that he used to, the working area for the garage was and repaired cars, whatever they did, mm -hmm. and they had a cubicle up above, and must have had to climb up the steps. I don't think he had an elevator there. Although there was an elevator in the the uh, building because the lead mechanic had a horrible face. Really? And and uh, somebody told me, he was a mech, but not McCarran, I forget the name. Somebody told me that he was once a handsome man, but he, one of these elevators at that time, they would open this way, huh. and it closed on him, on his face. Oh! Now I can't swear that it was there, but I had the impression that it happened there. Oh wow! And, and so there's an elevator at the dealership. Yeah. It, it was. It was a tall building. Well, it couldn't have been more than two stories. I was gonna say, okay, a two story with an elevator. <laughs> That's. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, we don't know what it was before they got it. They they didn't build it. Yeah. It it was when they took over, and probably they had heavy stock that had to be, you know, probably, oh, can't say for sure, I never saw a car in it, but probably a car would fit in it. It was, it was like, a, it wasn't an elevator that people normally ride. It was one that would um, haul stuff up and down that was, Heavy. So you said this Ford dealership, the McCarran Ford dealership, was at the corner of Damon and Division? Yeah, it was a little off. It was on Damon. It was on Damon. And Division was uh, the main street, actually. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, someday when I go to check out there, I'll, I'll wonder which side of the road it was on. I don't know if... I... <laughs> it was on the west side. The west side? West, and it was on the south side of... Uh, 
of Damon, of Division. South of Division and on the west side of Damon. Okay. I'll look for that corner. I'll look for that corner someday in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'll look for that corner in Chicago next time I go there. Now, let me think. Okay. Division ran. There it ran east, west, and Damon, north and south. So they were south of Division and on the west side of, uh, I guess that's just what I said. Okay. Yeah. We'll never know. We'll play it again. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's see. So I'm just going to take one more look at the uh, okay. tree here. So, yeah, you, uh, so you worked for Uncle Willie, which is my great-grandpa. And um, your father, you said, was Joe, Joe Sr., was a mechanic at the time. Or, or he, he worked, not a mechanic, but he worked a... No. At, he, he managed at, a at shop. At the time when? When I was working for Uncle Willie, or what? Well, uh, when you were... He was garage manager. A garage manager, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, he was getting to be a hula already. Okay. Okay, so uh, when your... Uh, so your father uh, worked various jobs over the years then? Well, the first... Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know his first job. But he had worked in a carnival that, as an electrician, he said uh, to me, on my birth certificate, he said he was salesperson. He probably was both, because then you did multiple jobs with a carnival. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I want to go further on that or not, or <laughs> do you want me to? Oh, I don't know, if you have something interesting to throw in. Well, Grandma... Mm -hmm. Was told, told fortunes. Oh wow! <laughs> there had to be reason for them to be on. And mother, so they must have been with it for a while. Mother was called the American Beauty Rose. Hmm. And I got all this from grandmother. <laughs> Dad never told me that. And grandmother McCarran. Me. <laughs> so. Uh, that was your grandmother McCarran, right? That you're talking about? Grandmother Margaret. Yeah. It was married to Hugh. Yeah, she so she was your she grandmother was, and she she, she was, was a my, widow already. And she was my great great grandmother. Yeah. And she was the one who uh earlier on when I showed you that uh Thoughts of May poetry booklet. Yeah. I, I, I suspect I thought that was her, but it might not be or it might I, be another Margaret, right? I think so. We have to check the date. It was, it was 1909. Yeah, we have to see who it might be. I don't know if if Margaret Dubois, if she was educated or not, you know, that much. Now, who who was the who she was, was Margaret? married to James Francis McCarran, one of the brothers of of your great grandfather. Okay, so basically, one of the eleven kids, the eleven kids included my great grandfather. Uh, it included your my father. father was, your my father. father was the youngest, twenty years younger than William. And then, and then, so yeah, so two of the eleven kids were my great grandfather, your father, and uh, this other one that you. What was his name again? You just mentioned it. James James Francis. James Francis. And then there was Aunt Bella. Okay. And Aunt Mary. Aunt Bella married George Denon, whom I stayed with for a while. And Aunt Mary married Joe Sage, mm -hmm. who I stayed with for a while. And let's see who else. And some of the, there were other girls, but they died young and I, I didn't know them. But that, that uh, Margaret was the daughter of James George or the wife or? Which Margaret? I'm so, well, uh, <laughs> that's confusing again. Your uncle James, right? Yeah. Did he have a daughter named Margaret or a wife named Margaret? He had a wife named Margaret. Okay. And a daughter named Helen and another daughter named Dorothy okay. and a son named Harold. So you think that his wife, Margaret, might have been the one who wrote that well, Thoughts of May in 1909? 1909 would be 
I mean, that could have been either one. But but you yeah. but you're saying you don't think that that your grandmother wrote it because she wasn't the type to be that poetic, right? And she might yeah. not have been as yeah. completely literate. And she, I guess, she died in 1941, a month before right. Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Your, and your grandmother Margaret, um, you said you spent a lot of time over there as a youth. Right? Yeah, I remember going places with her and staying with her in the city at some point, but I don't know the address or anything. Mm -hmm. I remember little things like we'd go on the Grand Avenue uh, streetcar and that would go all the way to Navy Pier. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, the first thing I would do is they had these telephone, uh, outdoor telephone uh, booths. Like, they're not booths, they were out in the open. Uh -huh. but, we learned that you go and look in the change box, and every <laughs> once in a while, somebody forget that he got, because back then, you know, you put money in, and you sometimes got money back or something, uh -huh. and if they didn't pay that much attention, <laughs> it would be a nickel or something. And, I did that as a kid, too. There was yeah. leftover change in a booth. In. Yeah. And um, so you're, uh, now you're, um, you, so you worked at the McCarran Ford dealership starting in 1935 when you were 18. And how long did you work there for? Well, I can't say for sure, but but I had a friend, one of my buddies that I played ball with, and he was working as an elevator operator at the Morrison Hotel, mm -hmm. which has been torn down many years now. And, and they said, well, there's a part-time opening there, and I forget what I got, but working part-time, it was mostly at night, mm -hmm. uh, I got more money than I was working at Uncle Willie's. No, he didn't pay very well then, huh? No, in comparison, because this was only part-time. Yeah. And uh, I almost didn't get the job because the elevator, they put me on the express one. Mm -hmm. There were 43 stories. The first 20, the local elevator went one, two, three. But the express one didn't stop till the 21st. Huh. And you stand in there and they want to see if you can take it. Well, my stomach wasn't that great. Huh. And I thought I wouldn't be able to handle it. But they said, you take the, the, the range, you know, that it was a, a type that went like this. Yeah. Once I did that, then I was okay. So how so how long were you working at the dealership before you got that elevator operator job? I don't really know, but a fairly good spell. So you you were I probably I would say there. over a year. Oh, you were there less than a year at the dealership. I I wouldn't say over a year. Yeah. Okay, so you weren't real long at the dealership. You and then you the elevator operator. Did you just go there? Did you just quit the dealership to work as an elevator operator? Yeah, that's what it amounted to. And then uh, did that part-time job become a full-time later? No. It just stayed part-time? No, part -time. I didn't stay. I mean, I I am not quite sure the connotation here, but uh, I didn't get fired or, or, or anything of that sort. I went to something else. Now, I think I went up to Wisconsin, and Mother lived in Wisconsin at that time. Okay. And uh, I guess it cut logs for a while. I even talked to a couple of my buddies to go up with me, mm -hmm. and they didn't last too long cutting logs. One day we went to town and come back. I went to town with somebody and come back, and they had gone. <laughs> didn't yeah. even leave a note. They, they, they gave up. It was too much work, not enough money. And Who would pay? Would your mom pay you to cut the logs, or...? Well, it was on her land, yeah. and I don't know if they got any pay. <laughs> it just cut. Back then, you have the time work to get by. Because it was Depression era. You, you seem to do pretty well finding jobs during the Depression. Yeah. That, yeah. That's amazing, really, you know. Then, then I heard that the Civilian Conservation Corps was taking in people, young people, who before that you had to be on relief, they called it, mm -hmm. and 
our family never was on relief. I couldn't get in. But uh, that sounded like adventure. I didn't know where I was going to go, but I knew I was going to go out somewhere. And so I joined up, was sent to Michigan, northern Michigan, uh, to a camp called Camp Higgins Lake. And they were mostly planting trees. And but we were logging some too because I remember logging. And actually I had a good time there because the town was um, Grayling, Michigan, named that after a small fish that used to be in the streams hmm. that have since I don't think they're there anymore. And for some reason I got in good with all the people there. I uh, played baseball there. I uh, even entered the Golden Gloves <laughs> tournament and that sort of thing. Uh, then I got transferred. I don't know why. I guess they wanted some experienced fellows to go to this new camp out in Idaho. Uh, it was, in fact, when we got there, they were still halfway building and was out it really out in the country. The other one at Camp Higgins Lake, we could go out on Saturday night and catch a ride in the town. And, you know, people took good care of us there. But about our now in the camp Kamama, the only thing close by was a railroad track and the trains would stop because it was a watering hole <laughs> and, you know, the water above. And we had, we were out there with the jackrabbits and the coyotes. <laughs> In fact, I saved two coyotes from being killed because back then they were, maybe still do out there. This guy was a professional hunter of coyotes and he got $2 a pelt hmm. from the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I guess I was around there. and. And I saved two of them and raised them <laughs> and kept them in camp, of course, because I was in camp. <laughs> and there I lucked out because I got on the survey team. And uh, I was the instrument man on the crew. The top man was, was the uh, uh, federal engineer, I guess, or a state one. I'm not sure. What, no, it was federal because it, we were a division of grazing camp, so it must have been a federal. And the CCC was uh, part of Roosevelt's New Deal, yeah. the Civilian Conservation yeah. Corps. And you, you, so you went there, what, you'd say like 1938 or so? or I, Yeah, I was, I was there longer than I was in the, the Michigan one, but altogether I was in 28 months. And before somebody catches me, you only could be stay in for 24 months. But when my 24 months was up, the engineer got me to become a project assistant with mm. him. And I would have stayed till probably the war or when it wound down. It never ended, really. It just kind of wound down the CCCs, I understand. There was never a law passed ending it. Mm. But, it but the three million CCC boys almost all went to the Army. Yeah. They couldn't miss out. Yeah. They were half trained already. So uh, now in the, so you were working there pretty much until World War II came along? Oh no, uh, I, I was there till um, at 39 and probably offhand I'd say maybe around September 39. That's when the war started before we got in. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what happened is my mother in the city had stepped off a bus, I don't know if it's still streetcars or buses, might have been buses by then, I'm not sure, but, uh, and walked around the front and got hit by a car, and then I was, I was called. That happened to me. <laughs> you got hit by it? Well, yeah, in 1983, when I was 18, I walked around the front of a bus that I got off of, and a car came in the other lane, but luckily... You know, I it hit. I rolled this along the side of it. So yeah, I think your mother and I got hit in the same. You know, half second earlier, I would have been right in front of the car and been slammed to the ground. Well, she got a fractured skull. And oh, 
Jeez. and a teeth knocked out, oh. and that sort of thing. And she was she was in Chicago at the time. Yeah, but she lived in Michigan, Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, she went back and forth. I think probably come Chicago to make money. I don't know what she did, except that I know at one time she had gone and cleaned house. I guess she. would Call Aunt Kitty, and I've always wondered about this mm -hmm. uh, because she apparently at one time before she married Dad, she must have well a Irish girl come. She was uh, we haven't mentioned that here, but she was born in Ireland and came alone as a teenager into America. Now with her family, hmm? she didn't come with her family. Oh no. She came alone. Oh, that's what Irish girls did, and supposedly they're supposed to have a job when they come here. But I don't. I think lots of times they just give the name of somebody, and from there they find a job. And I often wondered because somebody told me, and I think it might have been Tom, that at one time Uncle Willie used to partly as partly for the church, but probably because he got cheap labor uh -huh. to, you know, work for both, that he would get these Irish girls and they would keep house. He'd probably have one at a time. Hmm. And that he had to stop it when the boys got big enough to be interested in girls. <laughs> now, I, hmm. It doesn't seem like something that would be made up because you, who would think of it? Yeah. Because it just was <laughs> mentioned. And so I often wondered because mother, I knew, sometimes went to and, and must have called on the phone or something and, and Aunt Kitty had let her come and clean house. And she'd say, Aunt Kitty, memory was bad because she tried to pay her more than once or something during the during the day, and, mm. and of course she was, if nothing else, she was honest mm. as far as that, she would. So your mom would work for Aunt Kitty, right? Yeah. My my great-grandmother was Aunt Kitty, yeah. Oh, Catherine McKeon, wow. So I don't know if she was ever part of that, because that sounds like it could have been, but nobody's ever said so. Hmm, okay. So after your mother got in that accident, you went to live with her for a while in Wisconsin. Yeah, right? well, she was in Chicago in the hospital, mm -hmm. so I went to Chicago, of course, and and then we had a I, I got her out and stayed with a friend there for a few days, and it was winter already. Mm -hmm. So when I said I stayed till September, it must have been later than that, and I, I must have bought a car, and I think I bought. That's when I bought a Rockney Studebaker, uh -huh. and I have it in some pictures somewhere. And I had to pay cash because I, they didn't have credit in the days, mm. or I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so it couldn't have been a great car, but it got me up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got up there, of course there was nobody in the house, and no fire. This was the middle of winter because there's snow on the ground, that sort of stuff, and and I had to go out. I don't want to make it like I, I had a terrible life, but... But you know, it's, it's but, rougher when you're younger and you have all that outdoor well, and it, uh, farm rural stuff you had to do, you know? It, uh, the thing was there was no kindling wood in there, but there was fire there. Oops, time out. <laughs> Yeah, that was your son on the phone, so he just... <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead. Said he didn't come. Well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyways, the uh, interesting part, I guess, was had to go to somebody else's land to get mm -hmm. dry firewood because around the farm it was, you know, bare. Mm -hmm. And what I often wondered about, there used to be a flock of chickens there, I guess, and they just left them. Mm-hmm. And they were all gone but one. And when how does one chicken survive with the foxes and whatever around? And then I saw why that one could fly. If you ever had 
that do much with chickens, they just flutter around. Uh -huh. He could fly up into the top of a tree. I never heard of a chicken being able to do that. <laughs> he, that's that's why this one lived. It, it was a, a hen. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's thin because it wasn't eating much. But, Boy. But that kept it in shape, probably. That's crazy. <laughs> well, anyways, so I stayed there with her and and not only the fractured skull, but uh, it kind of never was the same anymore. It kind of, where there's pressure or something or what, I don't know. It wasn't bad or anything, but I mean, just kind of in her own world after that. And then along came the draft. And uh, Was this before or after Pearl Harbor? Well, I, we went up there the winter of 39 and 40. Oh, so before. So it was before. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure I had registered by, the, registered by then. And real quickly, I'm just going to yeah. backtrack for a second to get this straight. So you, during your childhood, before you got the job with Uncle Willie, you spent a certain amount of time living with your mom, a certain amount of time living with your dad, and a certain amount of time in an orphanage, right? Yeah, very short in the orphanage, but five years with the boarding school, which is not an orphanage. Okay, and uh, so uh, besides the boarding school and the orphanage, um, how much time would you say you live with your dad and how much with your mom? Well, I didn't really stay with the dad. So it was, you were never because, living with the dad? Because really? he, I was in boarding school, and then in the summer he would farm us out to... Okay. So he, I don't know where he, he might have lived in a room for all I know. So you just visited your father, but you didn't really live with him much? I didn't visit him. He visited us. He visited us, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and even though the mother, I mean, he had obviously paid for the boarding school, mm -hmm. but I think she came to visit more than he did. Oh, he didn't wow. come very often. But when we moved to Berry Avenue for about a, a year and a half or more. Uh, then we lived with him. We had an apartment, but still he was gone all day. And when we were in school, I guess no problem. But in summer, we were on our own. Mm. It was pretty good. <laughs> wow. So, uh, okay. So you helped. So you were living with your mom for a good year or so until the draft, right? Yeah. Yeah. Basically that. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought things were taken care of there, and a buddy of mine and I tried to join the Marines because we knew we were going to get drafted, mm -hmm. and that failed. Mm -hmm. We got embarrassed from that mm -hmm. because they had a party for us the night before. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, and but then we waited, got drafted. He went to the Air Force, and I went to the Army. Wow. So, uh, so you joined the Fort Sheridan. You joined you joined the army before the war, then. Uh, no, no. I. I went down. I should have been in before the war. My brother was in before the war. And I was, marked one A, and I came back and never got called. And I never knew what, why, and I. I used to think maybe my mother did something in saying that I couldn't go, mm. but it dawned on me later, because then later on I got called again, and I was 1A, and I went in this time, and it was with a bunch of farm boys from Wisconsin. Then it dawned on me, I had a rural route address, mm. so they had me pegged as a farmer. Mm. And, and they weren't taking farmers, they were taking this Tom boys. Oh, at the time. That's the way they did it, yeah, because they, they, they rationalized that maybe there was park truth in it, is they needed farm boys to work the farm. So so what month and year did you go in with the farm boys and get get that draft or whatever? That, that was August of 42. Okay, so what, what were you doing when Pearl Harbor broke out? Do you remember that? or? I was on the farm. And how did you first hear about it? Somebody... Another farmer dropped by. I I don't know if it was the same day or not. We didn't have didn't have any 
Didn't well, it could have been telephone. A... We didn't uh-huh. have radio. Didn't have, have anything. Didn't get the paper. Or if there was a paper, it was a weekly, you know, mm. out, out there. And uh, he come by and said, you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed. Well, where's Pearl Harbor? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Nobody knew Pearl Harbor then. Uh-huh. Now, of course, it's famous. Yeah. So, so you heard about it, but then it was like a good seven, eight months before you were drafted. Well, yeah. Well, they can only take so many million at a time, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like when Jim went in, your brother, yeah, uh, he uh, he said they had a lot of toy stuff, <laughs> you know. The roads weren't built, and this was a a camp that was already established, but they had to enlarge it. And uh, and we went into a new camp too when we went in. So you, your father. And your, your brother and your father all went into World War II. And I always thought that was unusual, you know, to have a father and son in the same war, you know? Yeah. Uh, but you say, now your father uh, was an officer or something like that, right? Well, he was a civilian automotive advisor. Okay. And he was offered a commission, which would have been major, but I, you know, I think. Long-sighted, he should have taken that. Short-sightedly, he decided that they couldn't boss him around because he was a civilian. But he had a uniform, though. Yeah, but so he could be with the rest of the officers without any, you know, uh, hmm. upsetting the like a civilian walking around with. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know they did that. I didn't know they gave civilians uniforms. I don't know how how often they did it. Yeah. Oh, they, they were there because I tried to look him up, and there was a list of civilian military. Okay. So it, it happened. It, it would be specialists that they would bring in. Wow. And, and he was an advisor. Huh? Yeah. That's wow. about it. Yeah. He didn't and, know anything about artillery, but he knew vehicles, I guess. Wow. So you and your brother... One and you were drafted. Was your brother drafted too? Yeah. Okay. And um, so tell me about you know when you first went in boot camp and you know what. You I know. never went to boot camp. You didn't. The whole group of us was sent to this new camp, and we went there, became a company, and we trained as a company, and we were always together. Later on, we got people that came from boot camp. I think it was a pretty good idea because you all were together from the start and you got to know each other or you got to dislike each other or whatever, you know, and uh, things were pretty well settled. I think it was pretty unusual. Yeah, because I thought everybody went to boot camp. Everybody went to boot camp. But, but yeah. But see, I guess when they're, when they're calling us up, then they were looking for a lot of bodies real quick and they just... We're making these new outfits, and rather than fool around with other things, they just put us in and trained us right there. Our top sergeant was the top training officer, and that was it. And he was tough enough. Uh-huh. The guys that go to town, I think the town was, it was in western Missouri, uh-huh. close to where uh, some of that, all that stuff they go to for music now and all that. Uh-huh. Uh, it, uh, well, we had plenty, the hills were all, we always, never marched downhill, we always marched uphill, it doesn't sound right, <laughs> but that's the way it seemed, and, mm. and it was plenty of rough country, it was the Ozark Mountains is what it was, but they're okay. not like Colorado Mountains. Okay, so your your whole unit stayed together. We stayed together, and uh, yeah. When did you get shipped out? Well, you were infantry, right? No. Oh. Combat engineers. Combat engineers. Okay, that's right. Yeah. And uh, we trained a lot like infantry. Mm-hmm. We had basically the same weapons, although we started out with World War One Enfields because they were. Getting so many people in, they didn't have the equipment yet. Wow. And, 
and I guess the first thing that we did is went down to Tennessee and and trained there in uh, war maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we went a couple of different places. We trained out in California among the tanks. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they were really training us for this stuff or whether they didn't know what to, they were going to do with this. Because we had all suntans, which is the, the, the cottons that you use when you went to the Pacific. And we didn't go to the Pacific, we yeah. went to Europe. North Africa first, actually, yeah. first. But we always wore over ODs. When we got to North Africa, they took away our suntans. We had sets of five suntans and one set of ODs. And all through the Sicilian campaign, we had that one set of ODs that oh, we geez. wore. So were you in the <coughs> initial invasion of North Africa, or did you go a little later? No, no, it was winding down when we got there, so... So North Africa was almost done by the time. <coughs> so that, I think they finished in North Africa, I think it was May of 43. I think they mopped that up, or, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, well, mm -hmm. I think we probably went over in June. Okay. So by then they were getting ready to invade Sicily. Yeah. Yeah, the island off the <coughs> off of Italy. Because we we invaded the 10th of July, and the story we had is that the Germans knew we were coming. Yeah. That it was logical, and but they were on the beaches with their tanks over the Fourth of July because they figured that was going to be the day we'd go in. <laughs> <coughs> and Maybe, you know, my, back home they figured probably that's what we should do on the 4th of July. <laughs> well, it worked out better the other way. Yeah, no, I'm going to surprise the tanks went back in, a yeah. lot of them. And so the tanks weren't at the beach. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so you were with that first wave going into Sicily with the engineers? The, well, I don't know if the first wave because I don't know. They kept, it's a yeah. long beach. so. But the far, first day, right? Oh the, yeah, it was D Day, yeah. Wow, well, and uh, so that's is that the first time you saw a lot of real combat? Yeah, because that was a. In fact, we lucked out because when in a LST, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to try to explain it. Well, no, I know what it is. That landing yeah, okay. craft, land, and yeah, the and, uh, beach. I say we we. With all the planning, we still kind of just shoved in boats. <laughs> and first of all, I think it was the Navy probably more than us because mm -hmm. we just got on the boats and went in where they were supposed to take us. And it was, it's always off before you're supposed to go. And so we were headed right into a place where a machine gun opened up on us. Oh boy. <laughs> and, and the Poor suckers, I'm saying because I know what happened to them later, opened up too soon and, <laughs> and it helplessly, you know, for them, landed ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And lucky it wasn't some chafe tail lieutenant that was gung ho mm -hmm. for us yeah. uh, to, but happened to be on with the major of the battalion. And they just swerved and went, we were at the wrong beach anyways, went down a ways and, and landed. So we landed without incident then. Wow. There was firing going on, but I mean, that yeah. could have been bad. And then they told me that they found these, these poor suckers, they're Italians. And they must have, there's nine or ten, I don't remember the figure, but that were in this a pillbox is what it was. They were in a pillbox firing out. And if they hadn't fired, and if they'd let us land and come out and wave a white flag or something, we could have just captured them, you know, because we weren't an assault troops. Yeah. The assault troops can't leave them. Yeah. So when they try to give up to the apparently since they were all outside, they apparently tried to give up. And uh, 
the assault troops, you know, they're not going to leave troops behind them, so they kill them. Oh boy. I don't know which assault troops, but it's probably the 4th Division, which we were attached to. Mm. And so those poor guys, you know, they... And they couldn't they, even surrender. They did, yeah. Boy, that's... But later on, they were able to start taking prisoners. And oh, yeah, yeah. If you ever get in battle, that sort of thing, and if troops are coming in, and you're going to be overwhelmed and killed, and you figure there's no use fighting, just hide. And once they go through, and then uh, the other troops come in, and they're setting up or something, and you come out with your hands up, you're going to catch them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You make them do some work or something. You yeah. know? But but uh, it just that 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 touchy that you know. Oh boy. Of course, no guarantee the guy still might got killed, but very good chance that. In fact, it happened in our outfit where you know, guys that, that came out and with their hands up and well that. So you do. That'd be pretty hard to just shoot him then, but... Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that'd be yeah, pretty cold, yeah. you know? Um, so, the, uh, so the guys were, uh, so you landed in Sicily, you made it through that campaign. Yeah. And then you, uh... And I saw the 82nd Airborne shot down by our troops and the Navy oh, and all that. Yeah, the accidental friendly fire. Yeah. And then you went to Italy, <coughs> the invasion of Italy, too. When, uh, yeah, yeah, went to Italy. Yeah, in fact, went through Sicily up, uh, up across the Straits of Messina, and uh, went up. We got about as far as the Naples area, mm -hmm. and then our. I was in the weapons squad, so mm -hmm. I didn't get to do a lot of the work that they. What, they were actually we did so much, uh, marine work, you know, practicing for landings and practicing for crossing rivers and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that we were almost amphibious engineers. And in fact, they they called the work crews when they were working on the beaches, they called them the, uh, what do they call these guys that unload the stuff? Oh, uh, uh, cargo or, I'm not sure. No, uh, they got a... The guys who unload? Yeah, and stuff. Um. Well, anyways, sure. that's what they call them. Huh. And of course, I just got to sit around with a gun or something. Huh. <laughs> and, and all through the thing was kind of that way that they did. In other words, not that we didn't do something, but but the regular work crews is what they were. Mm -hmm. they, they might be combat engineers, and they had to have their rifles around, although they, they often had them stacked because they were in an area where uh, there wasn't anything happening. They were trying to fix something that the tanks had broken down, like a bridge or something, or or the Germans had destroyed. Hmm. And so they did a lot of that sort of stuff. Hmm. Now, uh, so uh, I guess the Sicilian campaign was about five weeks. Then some months later, we went to Italy, or some weeks later, right? Something like that. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, we went said something like forty days without a change of clothes, or <laughs> I forget the date, but we had it down kind of pat. It took us twenty-one days to go over, or we were twenty-one days on the ship, and it, what they did is a lot of. A lot of dodging and that sort of thing, crossing the Atlantic. To get to North Africa? Yeah, wow. the crossing from, uh, we left from uh, Chesapeake Bay area. Wow. Wow. And um, so when you, uh, let's see, so when you went, to, you, you were going up into Italy for a while, right? And yeah. how long were you there before you got called back to train in North okay. Africa? Okay, we went, the fr uh, I, I'm going by Christmases now. <laughs> the first Christmas, we were in the in the, the desert of California. Christmas of 42? Christmas yeah. of 42. Yeah. And uh, 
I think I was in Palm Springs, which was a little dump then. And what they had, the, the movie stars would come out because they had horse racing there. And uh, there's still a lot of Indians around on the outskirts, and that sort of stuff. And I had my first <laughs> uh, uh, risky thing. My one buddy and I, his <laughs> name was, and here, he was a sailor on the Great Lakes, and he's in the Army. No. He got drafted in the Army. But, you know, they were just piling them in and, and mm -hmm. didn't bother. And so he and I went, it was a three day pass. Then a, we went there in a truck and slept on the ground in the in the stables because for the war, I guess, or for the winter, I guess, maybe. Not that it was that cold there, but that season it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we slept in the stables. Wow. And then, then we did what soldiers do. We, there were, it was like one street Palm Springs in. There was a, probably a few houses around. It was mm -hmm. nothing then, really. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, but there was a, a row, a street with a bunch of bars and stuff. And <laughs> we'd just go along there. And the Indians, I could hear them in the outskirts. <laughs> they were having some sort of dance, and we were curious and went to see them. They let us in, not in, it was outside, but yeah. let us come and stay. And, and you know, that, but we missed our truck back. <laughs> and Miss Bellinger wanted to, I think we better go AWOL. We, I think I'm, I want to go home. I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> we better not. And But we thought we were Dutch. And then mm -hmm. we stayed an extra three days and went back with the next group. And we got back to camp. We were in tents in our course. This was out in the desert. Uh, pyramidal tents then. And uh, went out for the morning. Nobody said anything. Nothing said. Mm. Waiting for some the shoe fall. Nothing. <laughs> and all I can figure out is that they covered for us. Oh wow! They figured, you know, that we just missed the truck. So it's a good thing they yeah. decided to go away wall because they'd have been in trouble for not reporting us missing. Oh wow! Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that lucked out, you know. Yeah. So then the next Christmas you were. Uh, next Christmas we were uh, in 43. Naples area. In Naples, Italy, in '43. Wow. And. Uh, the last one we were in, in the, on the German border with, you know, the Rhine River area. Okay, so then a lot of stuff happened between being in Naples and then. So yeah. you're, you're in Naples. So you... probably shortly after that. Well, we we went into, so we didn't go right away. Uh, we went into southern France in August of August 15th. So you were pulled back from so, Italy. To, to North so Africa. It to was go. A, a year and a month between Sicily invasion and the southern France invasion. Almost. And in the meantime, they invaded Italy and you went there for a while, right? Yeah. How, yeah. how long were you in Italy before you got called back? Well, I, I don't think we trained that much the second time. It's more to get together. Probably some other outfits too were involved, you know, that sort of thing. We just went back to be part of the group, I guess. So you were in Italy a short time, and then back to North Africa for training, right? And, well, and your brother stayed in Italy. Well, if you want to call Sicily and Italy the same country, <laughs> well, no, I knew we you were, were in there, Sicily, uh, but then you went to year. Italy itself, right? You were well, in Naples, yeah. almost a year, because uh, we went to Sicily in July tenth. Went into. Uh, the other place in August, so let's say we spent a year between Sicily and Italy, and probably a month and a half in, in Sicily. Okay. So we spent some time in. Now what happened in the Naples area, that's why we were in Naples a lot, for a long time, was uh, here again the work crews. Uh -huh. the, the Germans had sunk ships in the harbor. Uh -huh. And they needed the harbor 
the, you know, Americans that have supplies come in. The troops came up from the south like we did. Mm -hmm. and, but the replacements started coming in, and supplies, of course, is more important almost than the replacements, you know, when, because you got to have food, you got to have ammo, mm -hmm. ammo, and all that. And so, they, I was <laughs> never involved in that, but but apparently they, they'd even uh, rig it up so they could land stuff on top of the sunken ships. They'd fix it so the ships would be outside the sunken ships and, and bring the stuff in. Okay. Like I say, I never did any of that myself, but, and then, well. So you, so eventually, yeah. So uh, did you see much combat in Italy after Sicily? No, but we had casualties from bombing. Wow. Because of, from the first night on in Naples, the Germans, for some reason, I guess, we had a lot, you know, we had a lot of heavy equipment. Uh, well, we were a regiment, if, I don't know if we were all together, I couldn't tell you. Three battalions, which is unusual. We were not a normal kind of uh, engineer outfit, apparently. And uh, so when you've got three, if, if three battalions were there, they probably weren't, they probably were scattered elsewhere, but there's a lot of big uh, trucks and all that sort of stuff, monstrous uh, equipment. And the Germans spotted that real easy. It didn't take much. Mm. And of course, they always had spies in Naples. They, there was yeah. people there. And so the first night we got there, they bummed the heck out of us. And, oh, boy. And then we still had our equipment in Naples, but the rest of the outfit moved out. And then, I guess because we're the weapons squad, we stayed there protecting the equipment. And didn't, didn't your own, our own air, air corps, you know, counter the Germans? Or? Well, we didn't have it then. D they didn't have uh, air, air, air? Well, they didn't, they didn't have anything that could contend with the German bombers that came over. Really? It was the German bombers. But I thought we had all kinds of uh, air, airplanes well, back then. Well, I don't think we had uh, Mustangs in Italy till more of Italy was taken. Oh. I thought maybe they'd come over from Sicily and start helping us, you know. I don't think Sicily was ever that big as a... I, I, I always assume we had air superiority during that time because we were not, slowly... Not right wind. away. Wow. Well, uh, their bombers came over. I know that because and you, didn't, <laughs> and you were unprotected, pretty much. Huh? Yeah, and oh. and and our and our anti air yeah, the falling of the anti aircraft shells were more dangerous <laughs> sometimes. Than, oh God! But they could. They, I never saw them hit a hit a, a German ship or plane airship. So. Uh, Okay, now just real quickly, historically I know that we took North Africa, then we invaded Sicily, Sicily across yeah. the thing, and took it over, and then we invaded the southern end yeah. of Italy. Now the war Italy. In Italy went Italy. on until the end of the war. It kept the going. stayed up there. He was further north, and they, you know... Yeah, some... your brother fought his way all the way up to the yeah, Italian yeah. boot. But then, uh, let's see, so we fought... I know that historically we were halfway up the boot, right about... A, we just taken Rome, and then two days later we had D-Day in northern France, and and we eventually got a big chunk in northern France. And about the time we we're taking a big chunk, then some of those troops in North Africa went into southern France, and you were among them. Yeah. So you were the D-Day of southern France a couple yeah. months after the regular yeah. D-Day. Yeah, we we landed at uh, Saint Tropez. Mm -hmm. Our outfit they landed along, you know, always along. Uh, she, she, you know, mm -hmm. outfit scattered all over, but my own company. And you, and you fought your way up through southern France. Well, the landing was pretty easy. Uh -huh. Well, I'll take it back. We landed in landing craft infantry, which mm -hmm. means they had a pointy bow, uh, pointy uh, bottom mm -hmm. hull, 
and they'd leave us out in the water pretty deep. And we'd have Bangalore's ammunition around our shoulders and our weapons. And, and, and if you fell, you were dead because you couldn't get up again. Wow. And so that was more dangerous than any shell, shelling hmm. in our area. I don't, it might have been worse in some other areas. So you remember going ashore in southern France for a while? I remember tiptoeing in, <laughs> <laughs> hoping that I wouldn't fall. And did you see, uh, so was, so there was, uh, you saw some combat, but it wasn't too bad when you went, when you invaded southern France? No, there was some sniping and stuff in, in Saint-Tropez. Uh, but not terrible were, resistance? Huh? Yeah, just, yeah. And the, the free French come out en masse, young guys with FFI on their the resistance. Our bands, yeah. Did you see them the first day? Almost the first day. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then all along after that. And I've got photos showing in the area, Central Pay, and a, a girl with her head shaved. In oh, the, collaborator. Uh, yeah. Collaborator. Yeah. And, and the mother with her. And they told me that that was the mayor's daughter and that was the mayor's wife. Oh, jeez. But they still didn't say, but apparently, you know. Yeah, they'd the shave their heads in retaliation. And Man. So. <laughs> wow. And so, boy, so then you went up through southern France and you went up into central France, right? Yeah, we, I sometimes say that we trained crossing trained in our storm boats. Uh, others did train with boats. They had 22 horsepower engines, I forget what kind. And they would train to make a, a bridge. And they'd have these uh, small engines. I don't exactly know why I guess to keep the bridge mm -hmm. from taking off <laughs> down the river. <laughs> I don't know. But the storm boats were big powerful engines, 55 Evan Roads, and then we practiced, and we, they made us hit the other beach as hard as we could. Oh boy. To make it fast. And so, uh, so then uh, would you say that you rapidly moved up north after, after you landed in southern France? Uh, until fall. Until winter. fall, winter. Well it, well, it was August when we went in, yeah. August 15th, so I guess, I guess it was fairly fast in that sense. It seemed like we were always training for the Rhine River crossing. That was the big deal, is to get to the Rhine. Yeah. So by like, like the... Because that was Germany. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's where we wanted to get is to hit them in their, their own land. And so... Hit, huh? Everybody else had been hit by them. Need, they needed a taste of their own. Yeah, to get invaded themselves. Yeah. So you, uh, so you move north. You get to the Rhine River. Um, when did you get to the Rhine River? Would you say it was before New Year's, or was it before the Battle of the Bulge? You got to the Rhine. Yeah, but it was pretty close at the same time because mm -hmm. we weren't there too long before we started, you know, having some problems. So you said that the, that you were having some action in your sector. The Battle of the Bulge started December sixteenth, and the Germans drove east westward, and made their bulge. But that was north of where you were at. But you had yeah, some a, you had still they, had some action. But they crossed in smaller numbers, for we were kind of as a diversionary thing. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it was a serious attempt because there wasn't anything there, up there that. They were headed for the for the oil and gas or whatever they could get, and they weren't going to get it down south. So did you ever move north to the bulge, or you never oh, stayed? No. You were never in that area? Okay. No, we, we got to the point when we were on the defensive where we had to blast holes in back of the troops, in back of us, mm -hmm. in case that we felt had to fall back. Because, you know, it was touchy up north, and, and 
use as foxholes or, or put your weapons, machine guns or whatever you had, you know. Mm -hmm. And the ground was so frozen then, it, it was, you had a, actually, well, we had dynamite and stuff like TNT. And we, we blew a lot of this stuff, that sort of thing. Okay. Blue holes, you know, they'd be kind of rough, but. So, uh, now when did you, uh. And lay mines, uh -huh. that sort of thing. Now, d when did you, uh, did you cross the Rhine then? Um, did you guys set up a, you know, when you finally did it? I know our first crossing was a Ramaga. Did you cross later at another point in the Rhine or? Yeah, it probably was later because they, they, they hyped that as the, the first crossing, so. Yeah. But it still had to be crossed all over. Yeah. I so mean, you, one little crossing isn't going to do the job. So did you? So the point where you crossed, where, did you uh, see you know enemy fire coming from the other shore? Well, yeah. In fact, the funny thing is, before that, we were near Strasbourg, and if you heard of World War One, the Germans had. Um, Big Bertha. No, oh, that's a Zeppelin, wasn't it? Or no, that was that gun. That was that, that giant was a gun, gun on a railroad. That car. giant artillery. Yeah. Artillery, and they would fire indiscriminately because they didn't have you know a real target. But yeah, but if they hit you, <laughs> you were done. Yeah, that was. Uh... And we had Alsace any. Alsace was the area. Oh, Alsace, we yeah. And and, uh, and uh, it said. Alsace Annie, and it was a railroad gun, a big one <laughs> that they could move around. Giant gun. And uh, and I don't know if it was anymore, if it was the same time or not, but they would periodically fire that thing, and uh, more to disturb you than anything. So when did you get across the river? You know, I don't remember. Do you think it was like maybe March of '45 or something like that? It probably was pretty much. The same all over, but I don't remember okay. that. So then you crossed the river eventually, and you were in southern Germany, was that it? Yeah, we were in southern Germany. And what parts of Germany did you see during the war? Southern Germany. I mean, I mean, but I mean, like, any particular cities or... Well, I remember the worst city I saw, if I can think of the name right now. It, it's not one you hear about, but it was... It was a pretty good sized city, and it was all, it was done. And uh, mm. people scrounging around, because already Polish prisoners met, uh, Slavic prisoners, I don't know if they were Polish, but they were Slavic, scrounging around. And I understand that if they ran into a, a German woman, mm. they would attack her because they had been treated like dirt by them. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were slave labor. That they weren't ones that were taken necessarily as soldiers, but were just drafted by the you know Germans come and take them and and use them as slave labor. Just a couple months ago, um, I met a woman in Washington State who was a she was a fifteen year old German girl at the time, and she had to hide from the. Yeah. Newly liberated Polish and Russian yeah. slave laborers because they they were going to attack her. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So. Um, now you said uh, you saw Dachau before the war ended too, right? Yeah. Right after the liber liberation of it. Well, you know, I'm. I, Concentration. I camp. think I got the date down or something, but I I can't tell you. But it was in Germany, of course, because outside of Munich. Okay, Dachau. Yeah, that was a concentration camp so, near Munich. So I guess. I guess it might That's where that been. woman was from, Munich. Yeah. Well, we were there when it was still still Germans around, so whenever that time was, it, the war was still on, even though it was, you know, Wind, wound it down, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, because we didn't take it, but our, you know, our 45th took it, but we were there, the, and and were there for several days because they used our our equipment, or we used our equipment, they didn't. And uh, 
and dug, you know, just went with the equipment and, and dug out long trenches for to bury the bodies of the of the Germans. That's what you were. I doing. mean, of the uh, Jews. That's what you were doing. There was was doing the digging the trenches with the bulldozers. Not me personally. I didn't. Oh. I didn't. You know, I didn't run a, the bulldozer. They they were specialists. They were people that if what you would call the the where we were a weapon squad. They were they were I guess a the truck outfit or something, you know. Wow. So so it, you were at Dachau right after it got liberated, though, right? Oh, yeah. And you were there for a few days, you think? Yeah, I'm sure, because uh, our equipment people were there. I should have gotten some of those photos that it would have been okay for here. I could probably, maybe in a few, if we could find them. And were, did you have any assignment that you were supposed to do at Dachau? Any, you know, like, was there... There's not much job for a combat engineer at that point, you know? Yeah. Well, like I say, they, they had... We kind of took over and and tried to decontaminate the place because oh, yeah. they had they were dying while we were there and they couldn't leave the camp because they were no place to take them that was safe to take them and uh, really, all I could do is feed them and maybe somebody help a little bit, but some were too far gone and died anyways. Some were in pretty good shape. It depends, I guess, how long they were there or something about their ability to withstand it. But it wasn't technically a, a death camp, although they did kill them, yeah. kill them there. And but not like uh, in the north where Auschwitz and where they really made a project out of it. So uh, so then after Dachau, you were still in southern Germany until the end of the war, right? Yeah. And what where do you think you were actually at when the war ended? Like what like what was the nearest? You said you were by a uh, Kiem Z, the right? The Kiem C. And can you spell that real quick? Is that C H I C H I E M. And S E E because that's a way I guess German for C. Okay, and what's the nearest city to that? The nearest sizable city to the? I I couldn't find that on a map. I was looking. It's in Bavaria. Well, right? it was. It was, the Kiem C had an island in it, and the the Mad King. Mad King of Bavaria, mm -hmm. I think his name was Rupert or something. Mm -hmm had a castle there and all that sort of stuff, which had been maintained probably as a tourist attraction because we were staying in in a close by in in this place which had had Hitler stay there in oh, the wow. past. And and they were they were not the help. The help was okay. But you know that the the owners, they were they were Nazis, but they were Germans. Yeah. So, so you were there, and then, and then eventually, you you got wind that the war was over. Yeah. Well, I think probably the war was over then, mm -hmm. just about then, mm -hmm. and and we took over. The war was over. We took over. Our, this time, the weapons squad. Mm -hmm. We were all from Wisconsin or Michigan. We all knew about wood and stuff. We took over this lumber yard, and and had made you know work, made lumber because to build the bridges and all that stuff, the rebuilt bridges that were had been destroyed, just anything to keep us busy. Yeah. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, there were still two uh, prison laborers there. They were girls. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they helped us. I got pictures of <laughs> of us working with hmm. them, and uh, they were happy, of course. But they, I guess, they stayed there because I guess we must have fed them, and and uh, I don't know what happened later. As far as I know, nothing hanky packy 
<laughs> even though they were friendly yeah. and uh, like, you know, when a girl throws something at you, that kind of kidding around the... <laughs> shows Flirt, the flirtatious yeah. plane, yeah. Yeah. So you... Well, you they probably, over there, they probably, if they could get an American soldier and go to America, you know, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be a feather in their head. Yeah. So basically, uh, you were there and then you heard the war ended and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, there wasn't the, much the action war was at the ended time already when I was doing that. Yeah, and uh, and then uh, what, what? So what happened immediately after the war? Did you stay around for a while? Did you? Oh well, they had started building camps at, at, in northern France at a place called La Havre. I don't know how I've heard say. of it. Yeah. And and the camp that we were involved in was Camp Lucky Strike. And by then we were not a regiment anymore, and I wasn't the 40th engineer. I was a 28th, 30th, Company A. We they broke up the regiment, and so I don't know what happened to the other uh, bat uh, battalions. So then, did you go home shortly after the war? Well, we were. They put us all on a on a list based on the number system where. I guess mostly based on how long you were in or something. I don't know what. And then as we'd be there, like I had a crew of Germans that I was in charge of, and I don't for, know what they were doing. I guess it was working on the roads. Mm. But uh, I was I was a sergeant then, but it, when I wore my fatigues, I had corporal stripes there. Mm. And this these guys always, if, they had, if a squad worked, they always, managed to have a sergeant, you know, okay. the Germans or, or the Italian, so it works. And uh, the, sar the sergeant, you know, I could tell that he felt he was superior and I never <laughs> said anything. And he could speak English real well. Okay. It, it, he, was, he was educated, but he, he wasn't an officer, he was a sergeant. But they treated sergeants differently than <laughs> we treated our sergeants. <laughs> and, Mm -hmm. And then one day, I was going to town, we are going to Paris, mm -hmm. uh, and weekend pass. And so I showed up there, I guess, in my uh, 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 my dress. We didn't have dress stuff there, but a regular outfit. And I had my stripes on there. Oh, you're a sergeant, huh? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and I kind of like to do that, to have a little secret. That, <laughs> a little impression. <laughs> yeah. And, but another story there, and I told this to somebody not too long ago, they were asking. I said, well, yeah, we were there and we were stuck with crews, German crews, and there was a bunch of German prisoners and our bunch had come out every day and the French took a bunch and their bunch, they took out to clean, clear mines. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, and it was true, every once in a while you'd hear the mine go off you figured there was another German oh boy. got blown up or something. And and the guy said, well, that sounds like the French. Mm. I said, well, you know what? If the, if the French hadn't done that, you know who would do the mine clearing? Hmm. The Americans would do it. Yeah. And, we'd, and we'd be getting blown up <laughs> because, you know, we wouldn't know their minefield. We'd just have yeah. to go with the bayonet to find the oh, stuff. God. And if it was a booby trap or something, uh, so you know, I was I was for the. I thought the French did that. I was mad in Iraq when, when the first war of Iraq and, and we, we uh, put out the fires and, and cleared the mines. Instead of making the Iraqis do it. Yeah. That, that, oh, the Geneva Convention. So, but yeah, yeah. You, you'd think. Okay. So yeah. you. So a few years after the war, you, you met and married Polly Ann Rogers, um, and she became your wife. And this is a picture of you two early on. Yeah. And that was a wedding day picture. You're a good-looking couple. <laughs> and uh, you ended up having five kids. Yeah. This is a fairly recent picture, and now you have even grandkids. You had two twin girls, Linda and Debbie, uh, right? And then right. the... Next one was, which was the next daughter? Patricia, Patty. 
Patty, who now lives in California, and then Kitty, named after uh, my great grandmother, well, right? maybe. No. I, I don't know. If named after. Named after. Her, but her. I kind of like the name. Catherine and Kitty. Kathleen is her. And name. and then your youngest boy Joe, who's only six months younger than me, uh, Joe Jr. And he, uh, yeah, generationally, he's uh, on. He's not really on my level. He's on my father and aunts and uncles level. <laughs> And his twenty-one-year-old daughter Hannah is on my level, which is kind of a kind of neat, you know. Sort of interesting. <laughs> so then, so then you were your your wife passed away a couple of years ago. So you had a very long marriage from nineteen forty-eight until she 49. passed away. forty-nine until yeah. So you just missed a fiftieth anniversary, yeah? or was it forty fiftieth? We yeah we passed the fiftieth. Oh, so it's close to sixty years, right? Yeah. Wow. Pretty close. And were you, and now you you did a couple jobs and you ended up working as a map, or for the... I, I started as a map editor, and but they called us cartographers no, no matter what you did. Okay. And you worked there in, until you were 66, which would be roughly 1982, yeah. 83, and retired then. Yeah. Okay, so it's been an interesting life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, okay. Now the oldest known photos we seem to have is from Michael McCarran, who is your great grandfather and my great 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 grandfather. And what was his wife's name? Ellen Harkin. Ellen Harkin, and this is the picture of them. He died in 1912. So that's uh that is incredible to have a picture of them. Michael McCarran. Great 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 grandpa? Great, great, great grandma. <laughs> wow. That is. You said the McCarrans were from Northern Ireland, but not Northern Ireland, the British part, but the northern part of Ireland. Yeah, the Irish part. Yeah. Donegal. And Donegal County. So there's. No. Yeah, Donegal County, yeah. And then. In. Uh, that in Mina Hall. Clonmany Parish. And there's a town there, Clonmany. Clonmany Parish. And then a place called Altahalla. Altahalla Hill, near Minaha, right? Yeah. And that's where a lot of the McCarrans are from. Yeah, they they, they say that uh, that's the central point of them. The... Hmm. Okay, and and these were some houses that you found, and you think these are very old, ancient yeah, houses. Yeah, and, and the neighbors uh, stipulated which ones were which, and uh, these were all McCarrans. McCarran houses. And you think these houses might be over 100, 150 years old? Oh, yeah. Well, oh. that is interesting. Yeah, look a little run down now, but <laughs> nobody's lived in nobody's them for lived decades and decades. years, I guess, yeah. Wow. So that's your father, Joseph Sr., and that was during, the war, during World War II. So 1944, let's say. And that was him as a boy. Correct. And he was uh, he was lived from eighteen ninety five to nineteen seventy. Yeah. Well. So this is around nineteen hundred, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, that was a picture of your brother who fought his way up Italy during during the whole war, pretty much. And he, I always thought, you know, looking at photos, your brother looked a lot like you, you know. <laughs> so, your brother James, who passed away six years ago. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Picture of you and your brother around nineteen forty. And you're the one playing the guitar, huh? <laughs> right. Well, that is neat. So you said that was a Rockney, not Rockney Studebaker. Rockney, that you, you know, like Newt Rockney? Yeah. <laughs> Rockney. Rockney Studebaker. He was big then. Huh. And there's one there of him again. That was Joe. And that's his brother, Jim. And you said they look very similar. And your brother, Jim... Had luxury homes. You said you think it was Albuquerque, right? Yeah. Oh. Okay, which one was this one again? Which person was this again? Oh, James Harkin McCarran. James Harkin McCarran. He was uh, uncle of yours? Right? Well, he was uh, a brother of uh, Hugh, McCarran, uh, Hugh McCarran. Oh, it's Hugh's brother. Okay, so we're going up a bit. Okay. 
And you said he was in the Indian Wars and World War One. Yeah, the yeah. end of the Indian War. He was in the same outfit that Custer was. Oh wow! The same, the Seventh Cavalry. So he was Hugh's brother. Okay. Wow. And there was uh, you and you and your brother, James. It was James on the left, right? Yeah, James on the left. And uh, you're on the right. And Joyce, a half sister, is in the middle, right? Yeah. Okay. And that was your mother. Correct. Wow. And there was the other picture of your mother. Uh, before the auto accident, obviously. Yeah. Right. I'm not. I don't know. Or maybe she. Okay. So there was you in the army, and where were you at at the time? I don't know. Stationed somewhere with your buddies there. Yeah. Army buddies, well. I'm the one with the cup in my hand. Yeah, I see. Now, Hugh McCarran, uh, my great-great-grandfather, was married to Margaret Cusick, who I believed had written that Thoughts of May, but Joe thinks that she may not have written it. That was Joe's grandmother. And here's a picture of her here. She died a month before Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Uh, the Margaret, who might have written it, he thinks might be an uncle, uh, James Francis McCarran, one of the nine more children. His wife was Margaret, so she may have been the one who wrote that. Now, George Michael McCarran was one of, uh, one of Joe's other uncles, uh, who was also my great-grandfather's brother. George Michael McCarran had a few kids. One of them was James, Jim McCarran. Okay. Yeah, that's a better photo of him. And his son, uh, his son James, died in 1984. That was my grandpa's cousin. And he had another son named Robert, who has a, another son, Robert, I believe, living in, in Ohio. Okay. And my grandfather's brother, Walter, was very famous. Early on, he was a World War I soldier, although he might not have actually served in combat, right? You don't think? But he was during World War I. And later, he was famous as Cook County Coroner. So. And my dad told me he had John Dillinger's death mask, which would have made him famous. Yeah. Do you remember anything about Uncle Walter being famous? You were telling me a couple stories earlier. Um, uh, well, I knew he was coroner, and I knew he was was the, the Rep Republican committee man for Oak Park, mm -hmm. and uh, and he may have been the founder. If not the founder, he was the general manager of the Midwest Trucking Association. I won't guarantee that the exact name, and it was sort of a a local, a Chicago uh, union, I guess you'd call it. Mm -hmm. and but he, but yeah, you think there might have been some problems because because his son got his home, Walter Jr. got right. his home bombed in yeah. 1962. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh Okay, so you're saying that uh Uncle Willie lost one business, then he re then he rebuilt up to make the Ford company. Well Jim probably drove him around nineteen forty, maybe a little before a little after. So in that period of time apparently it was between businesses. Mm -hmm. Which means that the Ford company was no longer his or wasn't in business, I don't know. And, uh, but Jim says, and I don't know why he would, you know, even bring it up, that once in a while when Uncle Willie needed money, he would stop at a bank, and there was several banks involved, and he'd go to the safe deposit box to get some money out. And that was not necessarily unusual because when the banks failed in the depression time a lot of people were afraid to put money in the savings other than to have it in cash or something yeah and so the safe deposit box would be a different be safer kind of like the atm back then he, he just 
So basically, like as he was going bankrupt with a Ford company, oh. he stashed away a lot of money so that he could. <laughs> <laughs> That's the possible. Another possibly, possible. yeah. <laughs> Which, which is a smart idea, I hate to say, oh, you know, yeah. Depression yeah. era. So you had all kinds of money stashed away in little safe deposit yeah. boxes. Yeah. And that's uh, probably what I would have done at the time if I was, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, you said that uh, going back a bit in McCarran history, that what we had a livery that was Hugh, your grandfather Hugh or something. Was it he the one that had a livery or, or uh, something, the teaming with the horses, right? Yeah, they they call it a teaming uh, McCarran teaming. Uh, that was run by Hugh, right? Well, yeah, but uh, they all, at one time or other, the older ones, worked for it, the company, because I, in the city directories, I've run across all these names, and like after Hugh was dead, the son Hugh was working, but at one period, then William, apparently broke away if you ever been part of it and started another teaming com company. In competition and, with his own father? Well, that, that I don't know. They, they might have just expanded. Hmm. Oh, okay. So that that's opened the question. What does team what does teaming company actually do? What do they do? Well they uh, they haul for for people uh, who would be um, so they're like trans a truck, like a truck nowadays hauling. Oh, it's a transporting company. They transporting, tra uh, transporting goods. Yeah. They didn't sell horses. Oh, they no, tra they no, used the horses no, they, to transport. No, they hired teamers, which meant guys who drove the horses. So basically, like what a modern trucking company would be. Yeah. 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 So it seemed logical that they went into automotive area end of it. Yeah. And tried at least to have their own motor trucking company, which they had for some period of time. But and then that went belly up at some point. Well, here again I got from my brother that he was told that they had their trucks, I don't know how many, in a, a building and the building burned down and the trucks were destroyed. Oh. And presumably, based on present-day practices, and they they had no insurance, so they probably were stuck with a lot of bills because you traditionally, you know, got your stuff in credit and then paid it off as you sold it. Boy, so there was no, uh, boy, no insurance, yeah, but yeah, yeah, boy, and so he had a. So then they lost everything and. But later he was able to... Now, again, this is the story my, my dad told me was that... Yeah, that I, I'm not in a position to say what, what, <laughs> just what might think. Yeah. But yeah, my grandpa and great-grandpa sat down and supposedly... This is what my dad told me. My great my grandpa said, what are, what are we going to do? We lost everything. And my great-grandpa said, we're going to get up off our butts, <laughs> so to speak, and make another million but again, you disputed that he that they were actually millionaires. So did my aunt. But if they weren't millionaires, they were well off. They were definitely well off. Yeah. Businessmen. Oh, so yeah. yeah. So he did he did make the Ford Motor the Ford dealership after the teaming business burnt down. Um. Right. I, I wouldn't call it teaming business. Not teaming. Uh, the uh, the trucking business. The truck production. Truck production. They made a McCarran truck. McCarran truck production. So, and I've seen one myself. It was old then. That was about 1935. Wow. When I was driving right in front of me, coming in the opposite direction, it was an old truck and had McCarran on it. Oh, wow. Yeah, this, this was in the photos I found at my dad's house from my grandma left behind. This may have been a McCarran truck. You're saying it might have been, but it's stripped down. It's hard to say. You know, the chassis yeah. or whatever of a McCarran truck. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jeez. So that's your uncle, George, the one that I had a picture of earlier with the little girl goofballing in a prisoner's uniform. <laughs> that's cute. Now, my grandfather, William, which is uh, Joe's cousin, there's a picture of him as a little baby. Look very similar to me, my sister, a few other McCarrans. 
or McCarran relations. My grandma and grandpa on their wedding day. Joe never met my grandmother. He might have met her barely, but he didn't know any of the kids, which one of which was my father. And there was grandma and grandpa on the left, and I'm not sure of the woman, Uncle Bud on the right, who was grandpa's brother. And there was grandpa in, you know, his middle aged days. And grandma and grandpa, kind of as I remember them. Yeah, so, uh. Yeah. And then, uh, one of the siblings I didn't mark down, one of my aunts and uncles, uh, was Bobby, who died when he was only a few years old, around the early 40s. That was a, that was a tragedy. My dad never got over that. There's Joe and his brother Jim when they were kids. Probably around 1920 or so. What a cute picture. <laughs> yeah, so the, we're unsure of these photos, but there's a possibility it could be Hugh McCarran, maybe. But it could also be the Walsh side, which married well, the wife of George, George McCarran. McCarran. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Now, Joe, what's the name of this church in Ireland that you visited? St. Mary's in Clonmany. St. Mary's in Clonmany, and that's where Michael got married, and Hugh was actually born there, or baptized there. Baptized there. Wow. Well, Joe, it's, I know I, I'll probably kick myself later and say I forgot something, but uh, but any uh, final words of wisdom on McCarran family history or life or anything? or Anything? <laughs> well, I'll say this, that Michael McCarran came in to America with his one first son, the only one born, in Ireland, and and his wife, and they came in through Boston, and were there through at least 1865, and they, and they later went to Detroit, Michigan, and uh, well, the older folks lived there till they died, and uh, some of the McCarran scattered that I've never been able to tracked down, but I've been able to track down the youngest son and the oldest son, who was you, mm -hmm. and the second son, who, who was a Michael, and he never had children except an adopted child. And uh, one, James Harkin, I thought had never married, but apparently he did marry, but had no children. And he is famous for have killing, for killing a bear in Alaska or the Yukon. I'm not sure exactly which. When he jumped out of a canoe to, to get onto the land and, <laughs> and, and scared up a couple of bears. I don't know who was more afraid, but one came after him and he killed it. And it made the news, uh, a sports magazine. And, but. I've never known which one, and uh, he was also a musician, and he has painted one of the presidents, but I don't know which one. And generally, he had an interesting life, and he died out west uh, in a, okay. a home. But when he was supposed to be in the home, I found him still prospecting in, in California <laughs> for gold. He oh, was a true. prospector besides being a, in the Seventh Cavalry oh, uh, and that sort of thing. He, he joined, he went into two wars, the second one, he became an officer mm -hmm. and he was about age 50 or so. I can't vouch to the exact age, but. Hmm. Which one was this again? You. Which McCarran was this? Or? This is James Harkin McCarran. James Harkin McCarran, okay. Wow. The he, one that we have a photo of him as an officer. He was Hugh's brother. Hugh's brother, right? Yeah, he was one okay. of the brothers. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. It's been fascinating uh, to get some McCarran history and uh, 
it'll uh, enrich generations. So, thank you. Thank okay. you, Joe. Well, I know I said we were done, but I had to get this coat of arms real quick. <laughs> the McCarran coat of arms with a camel head on top. And uh, it's gold on top. Two-thirds bottom is red. And, Joe, you were saying real quick that you believe our family, Michael, came over in 1854 with his baby, Hugh, right? Right. Um, because earlier I was telling everybody we came over between 1881 and 1883. I must have misread something. Because you said that Michael's other son was born in 1854 in Boston, which meant he had to come over. And since he was born in 1853 in Ireland... That means he had to come over in 1854 pretty much, you know, so, or the end of 1853. Now, I did hear a story that Hugh came over later with others of the family, mm -hmm. but it couldn't have been the immediate family because uh, they only had, they were newlyweds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so their second, third... The children were first half dozen about were born in Boston, then the rest were born in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. But the first one was born in Ireland in 1853, and the second one in 1854 or five, depending on the on the uh, what date you believe. So they had to come about 1854. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joe. All right. This is the. Okay, I'm with cousin twice removed Joe McCarran again. Uh, he's moved since the last time I uh, interviewed him, <laughs> and um, but we're still in the same town, Kirkwood, uh, Missouri, yeah, yeah. which is a uh, part of St. Louis, pretty much, or or very close to. Um, so anyway, I was going to uh, ask you a few questions, maybe that I didn't get to last time, and then. It's possible we'll repeat a couple things, but generally speaking, um, I wanted to, after that, get to a couple of the McCarran history items and then also your life since World War II. So first I wanted to, let's see, ask you, uh, okay, a few, just a few questions I wanted to go into. Um, let's see. You were, uh, okay, you talked about your Uncle Willie, my great-grandpa. And you said, and this consensus between you and your brother, what he wrote about him was that Uncle Willie was pretty grumpy and grouchy. And <laughs> now I'm just going to ask this for the heck of it, but was he ever loving or affectionate? Did he ever hug or say, I love you or any of that? Or was it all pretty yeah, much? I never saw that. Never? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, uh, let's see, any... Uh, In fact, my father never did that. Yeah, it's some people more than others, others I, I, not so much, you know. I don't know whether it was the time when people kind of hid their feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Now, one other thing I wanted to ask you. My grandfather, William McCarran, your cousin, Bill, I know you said that because he was about 10 years older than you, that you were not as close to him, you did not know him real well. I mean, you knew him, but you were not as close as you were to maybe per perhaps say Bud. So what I wanted to ask is, um, do you have any memories specifically, um, hold on one second, uh, okay, any, mem any uh, specific memories about any conversations at all with cousin bill you know like anything you could drum up like where you talked about something or or any any trivial memories any little you know little things you could point out that you remember at all well like i say had more input with uh, bud mm -hmm. and even when we were little and used to go to the house i think he probably was the one up in the up in the second story, this is Uncle Willie's house, mm -hmm. making off he was Santa Claus or something, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Because he was more that type. He used to kid me. Bud was. Bud, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So whether it's just a matter of age difference, that he was a little closer to us. Mm -hmm. uh, because when we were young, he was younger, probably before he worked, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And, and uh, the others were all always more serious. Okay. So you just don't, but there's no thing that you ever talked to Bill about that you can remember off the top of your head? No. I mean, I know, like, if I talked to somebody in grade school, I can't remember the conversation, but I'm wondering if you remembered anything. Did you ever talk about a sports or about business or about, that, that you remember that sticks out in your mind? No. With Bill? No, I don't remember. Okay, so you remember him, even, just not specific. Even my Walter. Uncle Walter had an office, but he was mostly away. Mm -hmm. When he'd come in, he didn't talk to anybody, it seemed, you know. He'd just go in his office and do whatever he do, did in the office. Probably used the phone or something. And, because he was wrapped up, even though he says he's part of the business, he was always wrapped up in the other part, you know. the the uh, Well, somewhere along the line it was politics, but also the trucking business. Mm -hmm. Starting, he... I think he was editor of the per, or magazine that they put out. I, neither one, it's a different term than that. What would it be called? Sort of a publication. Publication for the um, motor outfit. Okay. Okay, Joe. Um, so we were talking uh, a minute ago about a. Uh, I wanted to ask you about any gangster related stuff in the family. Now, a couple things. One was the 1962 bombing of Walter Jr., which was in the Tribune or some major Chicago newspaper. Um, you thought that that was, uh, uh, they were aiming for Walter Sr. and maybe got Jr. by accident. It was a union type of thing? Well, a report that I have somewhere was by Walter stating that it was not, uh, Walter Jr. Mm -hmm. okay. stating uh, that it was his father should have been bombed. <laughs> Not should have been bombed. <laughs> they were aiming for it. They were targeting. They were aiming for it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and and you think that was because the they wanted to take was, mm -hmm. Go ahead. was that uh, he was involved with the trucking organization that he was a big part of. Mm -hmm. if not the main person. And uh, he, he ran it for quite a while. And I'm sure that the bigger unions, now I'm, we don't want to get mixed up between gangster and unions, mm -hmm. but the this, this stretch isn't very big. <laughs> you know what I mean? We know the unions are often controlled by gangsters at least back a ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if I say gangster, I mean the other... A lot of times big, there's tie-ins. The National Union, whatever it was then. Okay. So, back then, do you think that the reason they did the bombing, they were aiming for Walter Sr. and they wanted to take over the Union? Or was that something... And well, that was the reason they bombed them? maybe agree to compromise or become you know, join up. Okay. Because they were powerful in the Midwest, the Walters Union. I say Walters Union. I'm not uh -huh. indicating it was his, but yeah. But he was a power figure in it. Which union was he a power figure in, Walter? Senior? I think it was the Midwest. <coughs> Didn't it say something in it a bit? Oh, um, yeah, it was, uh, let me see. Okay, I have the obituary of Walter, a brief one. It said he was a Cook County coroner from 1952 to 1960, the first Republican to occupy the office since 1928. He was Oak Park Republican committeeman for 12 years, active for service in the family-owned McCarran Trucking Company, and for 25 years, executive director of the Illinois Motor Truck Operators Association. That's was that a union? That's it. Okay, and a publisher of the motorway transport a national That's, trucking publication. I have a copy of that somewhere. One of them. So, Not in the house here. So his mobster's probably trying to get him to play ball with him? That's what it was, yeah. Okay. 
Now you also mentioned, you know, off camera a minute ago, we we're talking about your your father knew something about some. Well, he he was manager in the company at the time that there were union strikes going on, mm -hmm. and this was apart from the Chicago Yellow Cab and Checker War. That was different. That was a battle between who was going to be the big company. Now, now you, I don't mean to interrupt you, but your father, you said he was he ran a garage before, but what you meant was it was a taxi garage? Yeah. Right, and it was, so he, your father was a manager of a taxi company, is that correct? Well, they had more than one garage, but uh, okay. this was the one downtown area. So your father was manager of one of the garages yeah, of a well, taxi Yeah, later he became above that. Okay. And so what were you saying a minute ago about, anyway? Well, it, he re was referring to a time when people were organizing unions and they also were doing it for the cab companies. Mm -hmm. And there was an individual, in, an individual, <laughs> can't say it, talk this morning, who was trying to organize that particular garage. And the most he ever would admit to was that he got word one day to put that person in the garage uh, cab number so-and-so to drive it. Okay. And do you know why your father was asked to... Well, he knew what it was for. They were going to beat him up. Oh, jeez. That's what it was for. He never said what happened. I'm assuming he just got beat up. You're talking about a cab driver? He was a cab driver, but he was trying to organize a union in oh. the garage. Wow. you got to get that picture. <laughs> yeah. That's the, I got the picture, but... Uh, from a later date, you don't get it. Wow. So yeah, so so the yeah, so the mobsters did not want him to try to organize a union. Um, oh no, this wasn't mobsters in that. This, this was just the, this was just the cab companies. The cab company themselves were beating them up, or trying to get some. No, they'd up? have they'd have uh, people come in, but there wasn't regular gang. The gangsters, per se. Or gangsters, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, into liquor, into prostitution, and all that. And then they started getting into, to unions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they were that far along on that. I think it was just the company trying to break unions. Okay, so which company did your father work? Was it Yellow or Checker? Yellow. Yellow. Okay. Wow. Um. So his bosses were telling him to get the cab driver. That's put him out. Oh, jeez. That's, yeah. And they have what they call strike breakers. Now, they had a different name for them, but... Uh, uh, Scabs. <laughs> uh, they, they'd come with weapons, not guns, but they'd come... Bats or something. Yeah. At, at, say, a rally or something. And it used to be pretty brutal. Jeez. Okay, um, okay, let's see. Did Uncle Willie get mad at you when you quit your job there to, to be an elevator operator? Like, was he mad when you quit? Like that I know of. So, so you just gave him, you just gave him a notice and said, hey, I got another job and he was okay with it? I guess so. I don't you don't have much memory of quitting specifically, right? Well... I had a better offer, even though it was part time, it was going to be more money. But I mean, Willie, Uncle Willie didn't get offended that you're going to know. someone. He probably didn't know it until <laughs> maybe someday he said, where's, where's Joe or something. Oh, so you, you talked to a middle manager, not Uncle Willie, about quitting then, right? Probably. I'm sure that's what it was. Okay. And, um, let's see. It's not like nowadays. It was just, you know, it was a cor corporation, but it was a small outfit. Yeah. And, you know, and, and uh, family mostly, and I don't know, it was just, 
I hear you. Not like nowadays where they write something and I'm quitting. There's none of that, you know. There, there is no... Like, I go crazy in some of the stuff I'm doing because it was... People didn't have, you know, social security or, or, or numbers or anything. They could almost use any name and there was no way of checking, that sort of thing. Oh, I know, but since you were his nephew and he knew you personally, I was wondering if he, like, he didn't seem offended that you quit for another job or something. Probably some... not. Okay. And, um... He probably made room for me. Yeah. Out of high school, just... He, he came to... Joe mentions... Jim mentions that... <laughs> <laughs> You're Joe. <laughs> Your brother, Jim. Jim mentions that... Oh, I got a son, Joe, too. Yeah, that's true. Joe. That's true. Yeah. Uh, Jim mentioned him going to the, his graduation. He yeah. Went to my graduation, too. Yeah, you mentioned that he gave you a pen set. Pen and, and pencil set. And offered you a job. And then your brother Jim wrote down that uh, Uncle Willie, my great grandpa, gave uh, him a job, too, when he graduated Steinmetz High School, I believe it was. Um, so, and yeah, that was interesting reading Jim's account. I'd love to talk to him if he were still around, you know? <laughs> yeah, because see. He stayed with the McCarrens when I left. I left in, well... To become an where, elevator operator. But, you know, by 1937 I was going out, out of Chicago. And he was just starting probably to drive for Uncle Willie and mm -hmm. all that sort. Probably for lunch money. <laughs> Maybe not even money, just lunch. Yeah. But, you know, there's interesting things about Uncle Willie. Like I've said, I can remember... He and I, because when he's talking about, in, we were just talking about uh, him crabbing at the people on strike Strikers, and that sort yeah. of thing. Well, we were younger then. I wasn't working yet for him, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So why we were writing, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> at one time, when I was working with him, he took me to the courthouse to see a trial. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was a trial, I guess, somewhere out in the suburb, suburb where the uh, poor uh, the poor guy who was you know, uh, bringing up charges against this guy lived out in the suburbs. And the day I was in at the trial with Uncle Willie, which she did warn me about, you know, was this big, huge, I'll say it right out, Italian-looking gangster. Oh, wow. Was on trial for, uh, they'd go around and, you know, collect money from the business. Oh, muscle man, yeah. Muscle man. And uh, this poor... You couldn't, you couldn't make it in the movies more obvious. <laughs> and the poor, meek-looking guy somehow or other had guts enough to do you know, To testify against yeah. him. And the big bruiser had, that day, had his natives, uh, his neighbors come in and say what a good guy he was. Well, probably he was in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. He was in a nice neighborhood. Yeah. He had to behave. He was... Somewhere up the line, I guess. It was. It wasn't the big wheel, but it, it was bigger you know, as far as the size. And uh, and I don't know if Uncle Willie went to it every day or not, or whatever happened on the trial. Whether the guy who who won. But you watched part of the trial, right? I watched the one day. Oh, wow, okay. But the day I watched it was so. So like the movies where the obvious size difference, yeah, meekness, <laughs> it could hardly. It was like some out of a James K. Even though he tried to talk well and all that, it was so obvious he was <laughs> a big thug. Yeah. But then he brought in these well-to-do neighbors who, all well, they knew, he's oh, it's a good guy. Probably afraid to say <laughs> anything yeah. else. Oh boy, that would have been interesting. I wish it was. That was an interesting period, really. Uh, Chicago. I, yeah, the 
post Capone era, yeah. Um, it wasn't. Post, it wasn't. It wasn't post. It was during the Capone era. Oh yeah, because. Oh yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, up to the forty. So that was the thirty. Yeah, that would have been the yeah. Yeah. That would have been interesting, like a, yeah. some out of a James Cagney movie. <laughs> yeah, we were alive when the Valentine's Day massacre. We, yeah, we mm. were along in age. Wow. Well, now, um, let's see. The uh, what do you know about Uncle, my granduncle Walter, your cousin Walter's uh, World War One experience? I I don't think he went overseas, but I can't be sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and he got in the motor pool, or sort of thing, mm -hmm. just by the name of the thing, you know. Just like Dad, when he went in in '45, he was he was as a specialist in uh, automotive because he'd been in that business okay. with with the artillery. So, uh, so probably Walter did not see combat. Not that I know, of, but he had the equipment because I once saw his uh, World War One hat. Yeah. I didn't see any uniform, but he had kept that. You know, you keep uh -huh. stuff like that. <laughs> Your father was never on World War One, was he? No. Okay. But I saw the the uh, draft information. You know. Okay. All that stuff is in the paper. I, I got it for Walter, too. It's not in there, but I've got it, you know. I've got so much stuff that you haven't seen. <laughs> That's why I ran a couple of copies off of, of, uh, of Murphy there to show you some mm -hmm. of the stuff I picked out of the... For my mom's side, yeah. Well, yeah, but, it's, but it just happens to... This is what I used for source, mm -hmm. going back each census and, and finding a birth date and a wedding date, which I was trying to get, mm -hmm. death dates, and uh, that's what makes up that. Okay. Um, now, can you tell me real quick about that uh, robbery that happened at the Karen Ford dealership? I guess this is a favorite story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not something I saw and it happened. Mm -hmm. Sometime after I left, that was told by Walter Jr. Mm -hmm. and uh, and they were down below while Walter, while William was uh, my great grandfather, your uncle, was Willie. <laughs> in the garage area where the workers were. And you said it was similar to the TV show Taxi. Were Danny or, DeVito, Louis De Palma, the character yeah, was, up was up in up that cage, the and you said it would look similar to that, right? Except he used it for sleeping quarters. Sleeping quarters. And to watch the workers. Okay. So. <laughs> and, and uh, apparently the robbery was occurring downstairs, in the or the money was anyways, mm -hmm. and he was sleeping upstairs, and they were practically on their knees praying that he wouldn't wake up because he had a pistol up there <laughs> of some sort and uh, would have come knowing his his attitude and, <laughs> that he would have come down gun blazing or, <laughs> or oh, trying geez. to stop it. <laughs> and oh. they were afraid because more afraid of him than the robbers. <laughs> Jeez. The robbers apparently were civil, you know, they just weren't there to kill, they were just to rob. Wow. So what happened in the end? Did they rob the place and Uncle Willie never woke up? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> did, what, do you, did they say anything about what happened when he woke up and found out about the robbery? Or, I can't imagine. <laughs> I didn't ask. Uh, did they ever catch the robbers or do you know? Or? Probably not. Uh, Probably boy. not. <laughs> okay, Um. let's see. Part of the expense of doing business. Yeah, boy. I'm sure they didn't have that type of insurance then. <laughs> okay. It's reported to be the Hugh McCarran number one. Hugh McCarran number one, dating back to the 1800s. Early 1800s. Early 1800s. This is inside it. 
with uh, myself and two daughters. And uh, Patty actually, and Debbie? Or is that Debbie Patty and, and Patty, yeah. yeah. And uh, <coughs> this is some of the natives of the area who we got part of our information from. Okay. And uh, this is another McCarran <coughs> house only. I don't know which one. But uh, he and five of his children <coughs> died and, and are buried right on the plot. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I talked too much already, and uh, just buried there. And it was during 1845, 1850, during the uh, famines. Famine. Well, it may have been disease, but <coughs> I have to get a drink. Okay. And uh, is that that same one again, one uh, of the other McCarran place? <coughs> I think this is another one. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that's okay. Cool. Okay, you're saying this house here was where Michael and Hugh, Hugh Sr. Michael, Hugh, and Ellen. They all lived before they moved to America. <coughs> yeah, it must be the last house they lived The last in. one. Well, and what, yeah. where's this located in Ireland it's again? A place called Binion, but of course it's not far from that. It's near Donegal? Oh, it's in Donegal. It's in Donegal County. Yeah, okay. all, uh -huh. Binion's just a... Remember, they didn't have vehicles to drive around in and all that. They didn't go that far from anywhere. Okay. And just for a <coughs> quick overview sake, here's Ireland in general. And Donegal is here. And where the little dot is, is roughly There's, the area where the McCarrens are all from. Around yeah. Altahalla. Altahalla is the... Yeah. Is the uh, town line. Township. Okay. Township. Okay, so here's a picture of your mother, Joe, uh, Lillian, but but she was born Julia, yeah. right? Julia, what was the last name? Healy. Healy, Healy. And uh, she passed away in 1966, am I correct? Something like that, yeah. Okay. You better add it than me. <laughs> well, I do it so many dates and stuff. Okay. Now you, let me see this, you were in Dachau. Uh, you were there shortly after the liberation. Do you think you got to Dachau like just what one or two days or a week after the liberation? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we were attached to Forty Fifth Division, and and they entered into it. I'm not even sure how much fighting there was because the Germans already were starting to, you know, trying to get people out and that sort of thing. Yeah, the live prisoners, and like I didn't know till just recently. The Dachau had three camps, and I think we were at the main camp because Debbie, I had mentioned 45th Division. Uh -huh. She says, well, there's a different division I saw. Well, then I looked up, and there were three different camps <laughs> and three different divisions uh, illiberated them. But so this, this is... Th Boy, these I were think. not these were not your photographs. They were taken by the no, but, by the company. But, but I have photographs. But you do of, have photographs you took with yeah. your own camera. They're and just I, not I here right now. I have photographs of our, uh, our bulldozers digging trenches. Wow. For the people to just dump the bodies in, and these were the local people that that somebody in power, in American in power, mm -hmm. I don't know who, made them come out. Go through the line. Oh, the uh, locals had to bury them. Yeah, yeah I heard that. Them, yeah. The local Germans, yeah. yeah. Oh, we didn't know about this. Well, yeah, they claim they ignorance. They had to smell it. Yeah, it's like, boy, how could you not know what's yeah. going on, you know? And, okay. uh, you know, when ran across German prisoners, well, the Italian, for instance, mm -hmm. <laughs> they are. I, we were their buddies, they, they thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, because never saw an Italian against us, but the Germans, you know, were a little more reserved, but I never felt hate for another soldier, because you feel they're in the same boat you're in. in yeah. Way. But I think this changed, when they got to these camps, this changed a lot of people's uh, Perception, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that had to be pretty horrible. So, so sometime, maybe not today, but sometime, if you get those other pictures that you took with your own camera, you know, with the bulldozer that you described, I wouldn't mind seeing those either. Um, and but but you say you think that when you got there, it was within a day or so after the liberation. Yeah. Okay. Pretty sure. Yeah, because our people were involved in in stuff there. Mm -hmm. I think even after some of us left to go somewhere else. Okay. So, no. except that we were box camera guys, mm -hmm. and the only, and like I said, and I'm showing pictures of the war and stuff, and I said, you know, I probably wonder, you know, it's like you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing something, you're not doing anything with the box camera. Yeah. Don't even have it maybe on you. You know what I mean? Uh, we, we, we weren't war cameramen. <laughs> but you're using your own camera we for were, photos. One we picked up somewhere, and, and this Italian kid, mm -hmm. uh, he claimed he couldn't speak Italian, but he could always get stuff from them. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, and, 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 and he outfit. got the film. We, we didn't get film from the government. We had to get overseas film, whatever it was. So I had a lot of stuff, thanks to him, because <laughs> he he had worked at a photography studio, this kid I'm talking about. The Italian-American soldier, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so when he got home, and he sent me all copies of all these pictures. That, and he even had them marked up by dates. And I get so crazy. <laughs> like we're looking there, there's photos missing. I, I got a number there, so, so I know the photos somewhere. Okay. It must be good if they wouldn't take it. <laughs> but it may be somewhere around, but it's only my family. But okay. still, and uh, the same way with I had these all blocked a week at a time, and. Well, partly it falls apart in time, but mm -hmm. but these kids start looking through it and they never, never put it back, no matter how much I tell. So I can't tell always what order no. stuff is. And it had it so much in order, you know, like from the beginning to the war. Chronologically. Yeah. Well, can, now this is going to be a totally different subject here, but uh, the McCarran coat, coat of arms that you showed me last time I was here, um, and I videotaped it. Do you know why there's a camel set on the top of that or no? <laughs> no idea. I, I'd like to think. Uh huh. <laughs> because uh, I don't want to build the things up. They probably were camel herders. <laughs> I don't know. And, and, Are they say in Ireland? <laughs> no, no. You know, if they go back far enough, they might have been in the, the Middle East. Crusades. Huh? I'm just wondering if it was a symbolic thing, like we endure like well, a camel. Well, <laughs> well, the Healy's got three lion's heads. Yeah, that's true. And that's like a royalty and, symbol. And there, theirs is real for sure. I'm a little doubtful about the McCarran one. Okay. So the camel it's thing It's based on be... the name Karen, but, you know, that's... That means like black or something like that, or in Gaelic, or Karen? I can't remember. Well, it's supposed to be Scottish, which... Which is all right because, uh, you know, I've done the Y DNA. Did I ever tell you that? No. What is that? <clears throat> Had the DNA taken? You know, they were doing that survey, and kind of like um, volunteers, although you paid <laughs> mm -hmm. to get it, and uh, and it showed that. My D DNA fits the DNA of the Northern Ir okay. Irish. It didn't, no surprise. Okay. <clears throat> Except that we are a small, fairly small group. Only 20% of Northern Ireland is from our group. And they, our group goes back to we Neal. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to say it like, might sound in Gaelic, but <laughs> but 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 Neil, okay. let's see, and, yeah, and he was uh, uh, 
you know, he's noted for when he defeats a, a group, he takes uh, not a slave so much as take somebody in authority as a hostage. Uh -huh. And I think he was called Neil of the Seven Hostages. He had seven important people from England, Scotland, wherever. And, mm -hmm. But anyways, doing this, neo, uh, this, this group we're in, we're also in Scotland, so who knows which came first there. Mm, so it's the okay. Y-DNA also goes across into Scotland. Of course, <laughs> there's a, of course there's a lot in the U.S. because I remember yeah. the paper saying, Two million Irish men in America descended from royalty. <laughs> but if you call a guy, and they all were at one time, a guy who went around plundering and, oh, and ships and stuff like that, you know. Uh, yeah, like Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when they became rich and all that, the, a call came or something, but. Oh, yeah, but it, not literally a king. But not, <laughs> okay. Okay, so when World War II ended, um, you were, uh, how long did you stay in the Army for? Through October 45. And then you were shipped home, discharged, and right? My brother and I landed almost, we landed the same month. Okay. And we both went to Dad's house. I hadn't been there for years, mm -hmm. but my mother had been put in a home because she had been left alone. Yeah. I After thought everything that. was okay when I left up in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And she had never been well after the accident. Yeah, you were telling. Yeah. So, I guess she was wandering around alone. You know, an old lady. And, uh, well, she wasn't that old, really. But, uh, but when I got home, she was in a place in Wisconsin to home. And uh, so I had known that early on in the Army. I guess Brother Jim had told me. Mm -hmm. And from, uh, from that time on, I decided to start saving money. And they took money out of my big paycheck mm. <laughs> and to uh, put in bonds, really, government war bonds. Mm -hmm. And so when I came home, I had $1,600. And uh, that tidied me over. No, that, yeah, back in the day, that was more. Yeah. Was, but I mm -hmm. had to have, they didn't leave it in banks or anything. So I had to leave it with dad and hoping. Mm. <laughs> but he's, as far as I know, he, he kept it all. Okay. And did your, uh, now you said Uncle Willie, my great-grandfather, he died just a couple weeks after the war ended, and obviously you couldn't make the funeral because you still hadn't come home from the war yet. And it was the story that he would had gone down to Florida and come back in well, Georgia on the way home? And I'm he was, not sure. I thought it was on the way home that my dad said, but it could have been on the way. But what he did say is that a priest in the neighboring town had recognized him being in mass that morning. So uh, that made some people satisfied that he'd been to church that day before. Okay. Obviously just died in a heart attack in the whatever you want to call it. So he pulled over the side of the road and had a heart attack and in Georgia. Over to the side of the road. Was he on vacation in Florida? Or yeah, that's where it was, yeah. Okay. Okay, Joe. Um, so I got some interesting uh, parts of your life today and part of McCarran history. Uh, but we're probably, like I just talked to you about, not going to finish this interview today. When I come back again, I'll talk to you about your life, particularly from World War II on. So, you know, just wanted to thank you for everything, and, uh, and we'll... Pick it up next time, okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.
question. This is Joe McCarran Jr., the third, and we are in Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery in St. Louis County, where we just had a ceremony over here. There was a table and everything for uh, your dad, Joe McCarran Sr., who passed away. And his ashes were there. They had a flag ceremony. Uh, they handed you the flag. And they're going to intern the ashes up in um, near Freeport, Illinois, where the cemetery, which I filmed earlier, where his wife is uh, laid to rest. Now, the reason I'm doing this is um, I did that first video interview with Joe Sr. And we went up to his life and McCarran family history and his life up to the end of World War II. Then I did a second video interview where I was going to continue from World War II on, but we got sidetracked talking about a lot of other things in his life or McCarran family history. Again, we never really got there. So what I'd like to do, Joe passed away on Tuesday, I think six days ago. Um, and what I'd like to do is, with his son, Joe Jr., who's just about my age, is fill in the gaps uh, for the history of Joe's life after World War II. And I did talk to Joe Sr. And Joe told me a lot of things, but I never had it on videotape. So I'm going to bring some of that up. Um, now, uh, Joe Jr., um, from what I understand, when your dad got discharged at the war, he came back home. And didn't your grandfather, uh, the Joe Sr., um, he, didn't he open up like a fishery and restaurant somewhere, something like that? Didn't he work for that when he got home from the war? I mean, that, I understood something like that, no? My father? Or his, your, father? his father, your grandpa. Like, I understood there was like a fishery, a fish, fish hatchery up in Wisconsin or something, but it was also a restaurant, too. They had something going on that I think... Uh... All I can tell you is it didn't pan out. It didn't, but he worked. I thought he worked there for a little while. I, w I thought it was some kind of shop, but I don't really know any more than that. Okay. It was some kind of shop that he tried out. That's what I remember. And then later he got on a road crew or something like that? Or was he, you know, when he, when he eventually ended up meeting your mom, wasn't that the case? Like either a road crew or some sort of a... Are we talking about my father? Your father, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was doing something like that actually with his brother. His my, brother Jim, yeah. My Uncle Jim. And she worked at a restaurant that was owned by my grandfather, her father. And uh, that's where they met. Okay. And she, they were about 16 years apart, right? 14. 14? She was 16, he was 30. Okay. And uh, that wasn't so odd back then. Now, <laughs> I think. These really days it's taboo, yeah. I think it'd be, yeah. But they didn't hook up, actually, until 1832, so when they got married. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, they were 18 and 32 when they got married? Okay. Yeah, and you didn't mess around back then until you got married. At least that's what... Officially. <laughs> At least that's what they said. Yeah. My mother told me, but... My, uh, my last girlfriend and I were, you know, she was 19 and I was almost 37 when we started dating, so we had a 17-year gap, so I... I can identify with your dad. Well, I like young women myself. <laughs> yeah, same here. They're yeah. My, when they're my age, they're a little... Eh. No, I, 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 gee, trust me, I know where you're coming from, but... They, they're, they're a little bit more cynical. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Um, so, uh... I keep telling my daughter, bring, bring some of your girlfriends. Friends. <laughs> you're eating my mind, I swear. <laughs> we think great minds think alike. Um, definitely, uh... Now that say. she's 27. Yeah. Um... Well, uh, so, okay, so he worked, I thought he worked on a road crew or someone came through there and to that restaurant, and that's how he I did, met her. Yeah, he did a lot of work, you know, a, a lot of different kind of stuff, you know, uh, um, um, lumberjack, surveyor, he did a lot of different things, so, but, you know, low-paying kind of labor kind of jobs. And was there marriage ceremony, I guess, was it a, just a quick courthouse thing? It, it did, I, from what I heard, it wasn't any big thing. It was just those two went off somewhere, I think, by themselves, as far as I know. You don't know what date they got married, I never married, saw no. any wedding pictures or anything, just them in a, in a picture, a marriage picture of some kind, and, uh... 1949, I guess, they got 49. married. Yeah. 
And uh, as far as I know, I never saw any wedding pictures. I never heard about any wedding. I think they just kind of made it a quiet thing with the two of them. Yeah, and your mom, I saw you know, young pictures of your mom. She's a very beautiful woman. She was, you know, she, she modeled. They asked some guy on the Illinois University. I guess when he was going to school there, she was pretty young and hanging around there, doing some kind of small work there. I don't and her name was Polly Rogers when she was born, and then she right. became Polly McCarran. And some guy asked her to model, and she modeled her. Did some advertisement magazine. Really? When she was a teenager? Well, after she got married? She was about 19 or something. Okay. Soon after they were married, they didn't have kids yet, and he was on the campus, and somebody saw her, and there's pictures of it, too. I didn't know that. I'd like to see that sometime, yeah. Yeah, she's posing with clothes. And so, um, now what were some of the jobs? So, so kind of give me a progress from the time they got married, like kids, jobs that he had, m places that he moved. Kind of give me a synopsis of what happened, you know, in, in what order after that, you know? After that? Well, you know, from the time, of, let's say from the time he got married. Okay, the, the jobs, the Went moving. Went to school. Went to pretty school? Pretty soon after that, and they were pretty poor. They were poor. Where did he go to school at? Uh, University of Illinois. Oh, okay. So he's up by Champaign Urbana, where I, right. not where I live, but I'm. That's my state, yeah. And uh, you went to Northern Illinois. I went to NIU, Northern DeKalb, where I, I still live in DeKalb, yeah. Right. And uh, then my nephew graduated U of I. Yeah. As far as I know, it was uh, he could have went in, got his PhD, finished up, but uh, what degree? What what major? Got, uh, well, mathematics, you know, science, uh, uh -huh. was his, you know. And he actually taught for a while. I didn't even remember him saying, telling me that before. Astronomy teacher up at the Science Center. Wow. Uh, yeah. He had an impressive life. Yeah. His later life, he lived quietly. Um, well, he got a map job, right? I say quietly, but he went off traveling. He, he traveled the world by himself. He wanted mm -hmm. to go along, and uh, I don't blame him. Uh, just, he went out and traveled a lot. He didn't take your mom with too much, or? No, uh, she was living, they were separated for a while. Separated oh, I didn't know that. For several years. She lived in Denver. I lived with her in Denver. Did they I get went back to high to... school in Denver. I didn't know that. Yeah. Did they ever get back together? Yeah, when she got sick, she came back and lived in Denver. They lived together in the last, uh, let's see, probably mid '90s. She got sick and she couldn't work anymore. And how long were they separated from for? '95 to 2008, when she died, they were together. Uh, they were. Uh, I was 12, and 12, 12, about 12 years. Wow. She lived in Denver, Texas, Houston, Texas, and uh, Minnesota. Your dad's a nice guy. I'm surprised they couldn't get along. Well, you know. Well, I guess people have their issues. She was a difficult woman. She Again, was, I know nothing about her. Yeah. She uh, she had she just wanted to go off on her own and be her own woman. I guess. Uh, I don't know all the details. I was busy with my own thing. I hear you. When you're a young young guy, you're. That's not my problem. So basically, his first two kids were the twins, uh, Debbie and Linda. What? That's when he, he he got out of college early and went to work. And uh, was that the work with the map thing, the cartoon? And what, what was that again? It was the. That's all he did till uh, 1982. And what was the official? It was a government agency, right? Yeah. So 1954 to uh, well, 19 might have been a little later, 1955 approximately to 1982. And what was the name of the agency he worked for? Well, God, I know. It's it. the United States something. Uh, Defense Mapping Agency, I think. So they, they studied maps, they made maps. I know it, I just can't, I can't think of everything. But it, it, it's down there right now, it's downtown St. Louis, right on the riverfront. And what was his job in there? What did he do with the maps? Well, I don't know all the details of that. Okay. <laughs> but something to do with military maps, yeah, creating them or analyzing them or something. You know a little bit about history? You ever heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, his crew. I guess discovered those uh, hiding, missiles. Hiding, uh, 
the uh, missiles over there in Cuba. Wow. They were the ones that discovered it. And you know, the funny thing about it, I asked him a lot of questions, and still, I guess, to the end, he goes, some things are secret that I was sworn to secrecy about, so there's some things that he couldn't speak about. He took with him, huh? Yeah, he took with him. Wow. And he was, you know, he took an oath, so and he stuck to it. Wow. So there were some things that happened that probably would have been surprised by, but he couldn't go there. Huh. He worked for the government, you know. Wow. So he got that job about 10 years after the war. Yeah. And uh, he was married by then. And, and, uh, and what years were Debbie and Linda born, do you remember? 54. Like, 54. 1954. Okay, so he's still in college or just getting out of college, right? Yeah, they were like born there in Champaign. Right. In Champaign, okay. And they came over. I won't swear to it, but they soon... They might have went somewhere else in between, but then they ended up here in uh, Maplewood. Okay, and when was the next daughter, Patty, born? 57. And then uh, Kitty, the third, the fourth daughter, 58. And then seven more years before you were born, the first boy, Joe, and the last child. 1965. 65. And you're, you're seven months younger than me, or just a few months. You're August, right? This month is your birthday? They call 1965 when America culturally completely changed the culture. I mean, uh, so, uh, That's when we started NAM, you know? Yeah, the NAM thing, uh, just, the, it was a real cultural change. And uh, they, I always say 1965 really was, they said that uh, 1965, the 50s ended. In other words, the culture was still kind of the same as it was yeah. in the 50s until 1965. People still dressing the same and Listen to similar music, and <laughs> clothes, and the fedora hats, even for older people. Yeah, they were still. Yeah. Kennedy killed the hat business. They said. Yeah. So you were, um, so you were basically, uh, yeah, basically my. So they had you guys in a row, and he, and he was working on that map thing pretty much your whole. Yeah. Yeah. That's your whole life up until you were seventeen that. when he retired. Yeah, he stayed with that company. Um, do, you, do you remember, did he have a retirement party or summer? I was in Denver. Okay, with your mom? No. Well, yeah, I was with her. Let's see. And then I went back there to live on my own for a while. I would back and forth a lot. But at the time they had the party and all that, I was not there. And your siblings, uh, did they stay with your dad or were they already adults by the time your parents separated? Some of us stayed. Uh, Debbie was married in 72. Yeah, 73, yeah. And, they married uh, pretty young. was born 78, somewhere around there. Or you mean married? I don't even re really remember living with Debbie. I was so young. Wow. So, uh, and then uh, Patty, Patty would leave and come back, leave and come back. And Katie and me stayed there for quite a while. Kind of with the kids in the house there for a while. Huh. Wow, so, so he had five kids in his main career uh, through his life. The main one was that uh, through the MAP agency. Yeah, um, everything before that was low paying stuff. It wasn't career stuff. And then uh, after, so he, he had a very long retirement. That's like 34 years, right? He, yes. Depending on what month he retired, you don't remember what month, in 82, no? I know because my last girlfriend was born in '82 and she's 34 now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, unless it was uh, lately. Most people don't get to retire that long. Yeah, that's a that's a night, and you know, your dad was so healthy and everything all the way up until a year or two ago. So, and like I said, I always have a big, big regret that I could not come here for a hundredth birthday party like I wanted to, you know. But uh. We kind of figured he would that night. Yeah. We can't even get through that. I, I kind of, from what I was hearing, I was biting my nails too. I don't think he's going to make it till February next year. I, you know? I didn't, his quality of life was so low, so. Yeah. It was uh, not very much fun. Not a lot of joy at the end for him, so just everything was just shutting down. Do you know what he officially passed away from, or was there an official cause? Old or, age. Just old age, yeah. Officially everything just was shutting down. And uh -huh. 
the, uh, well, I don't, did you see his foot? It was rotten away. No, I didn't, no. We couldn't remove, he was too old, so if we would have removed the foot, he wouldn't have survived the operation because of his age. Oh my God. Was it gangrene or something? Well, eventually it became that. We had him on antibiotics, just keeping him alive, but, uh, Everything just, the liver shut down, kidneys shut down, Aww. heart started finally, his heart was good for a long time, and, but everything was shutting down, his mind was shutting down. And this um, is all in the last two years, right? He had become so weak, he just couldn't do anything, couldn't lift himself up, and if you helped him, everything hurt him. If you touched him like that, he would be in pain, so it was real hard, it was not a lot of fun, he just slept a lot. It was hard. That's too bad because he was up and walking all the way. Was it? Two, would you say two years ago is when everything started going bad? Yeah. Well, a year and a half, I'd say. Really. His ninety-eighth birthday. I was going to take him to the barber get his haircut, and that's when he, he was getting hard. He was just getting up and he would have had to be on a walker. That's when it. You know, when he started doing the walker, he was walking around pretty well before that. Yeah, so he had a, it wasn't a long, long illness, you know, it was, uh, he got to live healthy for a long time. He's always been old to me. Yeah, your whole life, huh? Yeah, he's always seemed like an old guy to me, so. Well, let's see, in 1965. He was 48. 48 years old, wow. Yeah. And so by the time you even have memories of him, he's into his 50s, you know? Yeah, he was, I was the guy with the oldest father, that's for sure. Yeah. I was the guy with the old, old dad, but he was in good shape, so. Yeah, he was. Okay. Now, one thing that I thought was interesting was uh, on the World War II honor flight, uh, everybody, all the old veterans were able to take one relative with them. And when I saw a video of it, everybody's exiting the plane. It's like the relative pushing the veteran in a wheelchair, one after the other, after coming off the plane, they videotape. But your dad is just out there walking alongside him. He seemed to be the one guy's on his feet back then. Yeah, he you was know? probably older than a lot of them. Uh, yeah. He was kind of old when he went in. A lot of them were 18. He was like 24 when he got in. So by the end of the war, he was 27. He was no kid. Yeah. However, uh, I didn't go with him. You saw video footage of that? I saw video footage of them coming back from the interflight. Like 2008 or something? 2009? Something like that? I think so, because I, I think I met, I, I met him in person in 2010. Yeah, so they went on a plane. Out there, and who do you go with? My sister Kitty. Kitty, okay. I didn't go. I don't fly. <laughs> I love DC, but I never seen that moment. I have to drive everywhere. I hear you. If I go, because I have a sinusitis. If I get on a plane, it's like torture. Oh. Uh, torture. And is um, but what you were telling me, uh, you went with your dad to the 50th reunion of uh, his veterans group. He had never gone till the last one. And I go, well, it's the 50th, so let's go. Nah, he said, nah. I go, I'll go with you. And he goes, well, if you go with me. So I went with him. And I met all those old guys I'd seen in the photographs. Uh -huh. And I recognized them right away. Wow. And uh, they saw me, and I was that age when they last saw him. So they said they knew it was him because they saw me. They said, <laughs> That's how we remember you. They wouldn't have recognized him. Yeah, because you looked like he did back then. Right. And he looked like an old man they would have never recognized. No, he wouldn't. They, and he shrunk so much. He, he did. You know, he didn't look the same. Yeah, I seen pictures of them as a young man. You did have a strong resemblance to him yeah. back then. So. And yeah, what, how old he got? Uh, you will never see me look like that because I won't make it that. Oh, I hope you do. I hope you do, buddy. Because you know? I smoke. Yeah. I'm gonna smoke one even if it bothers you. I'm pretty <laughs> far away from you. Okay. Well, we're, that's pretty much what I wanted to know anyway. So thank you, Joe. Sure. And you have a good one. And there's no more questions. That's uh, that's about all I could think of. If I think of any else, I'll do a quick addendum. <laughs> okay. Signing out.